This episode of Horror Movie Talk is brought to you by water. The National Water Council wants to remind you that it's safe to go back in the water. Water is one of the most popular recreational liquids in all of history, and it's the favorite beverage of Vice President Mike Pence. You may have your doubts after watching movies such as Jaws, Open Water, Piranha, Deep Blue Sea, Below, Sphere, Underwater, Leviathan, Blackwater, Deep Rising, Anaconda, The Deep, The Perfect Storm, The Abyss, Deep Star Six, Franken Shark, Lake Placid, and The Reef, but there's nothing to worry about. It'll be fine. Swim! If there's one thing we can tell you about the ocean, with its infinite expanse into the horizon and the inky depths of a lightless void beneath you, it's that there's room enough for everyone. So come on down to the water. Hello and welcome to Horror Movie Talk. An opinionated and accidentally funny horror movie review show. Go, 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 go. releases always get priority but we also review older horror movies both good and horrible wow that didn't sound good what's up Doc? what's up it's your boys <laughs> i messed up your i immediately messed up your <laughs> my flow your flow you were like oh okay uh. <laughs> Welcome, welcome, everyone, to Horror Movie Talk. I'm Dr. Bryce Hansen, the foremost expert in scare... No, no, wait a minute. Wait, that's me. I'm Shit. Professor David Day, the foremost expert in scare no no's. You hold a PhD in spookology. Oh, that's, that's what happens when I go off script. You threw me into the loop. I'm sorry. With that Bugs Bunny. Threw you into the depths. Do you ever find yourself attracted to Bugs Bunny when he, whenever he wore a dress? <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> no <laughs> neither do i i was just asking um so this is horror movie talk if you're new to the podcast we talk about horror movies as in the title check out our website at horrormovietalk.com there you'll find links to all of our social media you can contact us or all of our listeners that have a really great group going on facebook called Horror Movie Talk Yeah, group. the Facebook Horror Movie Talk group. Uh, we post new episodes every Wednesday, so subscribe on your favorite platform. And if you're on an Apple uh, if you're on Apple Podcasts, leave us a review, because that really helps us out. Call us at 682-253-4468 to leave us a voicemail, and later today you'll hear some of the voicemails that we need to catch up on. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a minute, <laughs> as the kids say. We've got a great show today. Today we're talking about a little-known indie film called Jaws. It, I, I am like it's been twelve to fifteen years since I've seen Jaws, and and I've seen it many times. Yeah, and it's just just unbelievably good movie, right? I watched it. Well, I'll get into it in the yeah, yeah, spoiler yeah. section, but yeah, I've I watched it a couple of years ago. Every episode, we start out by giving a brief review and our score for the movie. We score on a scale of one to ten. One being a miserable dredge where it makes you angry. Five being an average film that hits all the expected marks, and ten being so good it transcends genre boundaries. <laughs> After we give our score, we'll get into spoilers and take a deeper dive. <laughs> if you're new to the horror movie talk. And you find yourself right now offended at the amount of belches, you know, you can it, just leave. It tends it's to fine. it tends to slow down. Bryce doesn't uh doesn't he he can't he builds up a head of steam at the start to like right. scare you away. And I mean, it, if you don't like it, don't leave a review about how much you hate it. Just stop listening. Maybe don't I'm, talk about that part. I'm okay. Yeah. Well, now you've done it. Oh, shit. Um after we give our score for the film, we'll get into spoilers and take a deeper dive into what we liked and hated about the film. And then later on, we'll be doing a bit called Horror Movie Whores, mm -hmm. where it's us checking our voicemail. 
It's, uh, we had to make the, the title as offensive as possible for something as mundane as just checking our voicemail. Right. Well, I mean, well, and we needed to name our right. listeners. Right. Uh, we have a big blockage, big backup. It's pretty thick. Mm-hmm. A thick, ropey loads of your voice voicemail calls. So let's get into the movie. Patrons voted on this one. Um, if you want to influence how we what movies review become a patron and you can tell us and vote on it we rewatched jaws and if you don't like this movie you probably don't like movies yeah i mean this is um this has got everything it's got a ton of setups mm-hmm. and then payoffs it's mm-hmm. got um a tremendously uh compelling baddie uh-huh. um and it's got character arcs that are just yeah. Perfect. Yeah. They're just perfect. I'd also like to say Richard Dreyfus is the most annoying actor ever. <laughs> and I don't hold it against him. He's just plays the annoying guy. Huh. Like Rick Moranis plays the nerd. Right. You know? Uh, yeah. So right. That's yeah. all I have to say about that. You're not wrong. This is also like a perfect example of like a, a movie that really depends on three characters being together. Yeah. Like, it's, it's a really good, like, three-character, like, person-in-a-room type movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, it, yeah, it does depend on them for the vibe. It gives off this bro kind of vibe uh, yeah. towards that towards that last third act. Yeah. Um, that's just, yeah, it, it really makes the whole thing. Yeah. So, anyways, let's uh, play the trailer for Jaws. There is a creature alive today who has survived millions of years of evolution without change, without passion, and without logic. It lives to kill. A mindless eating machine. It will attack and devour anything. It is as if God created the devil and gave him jaws. (laughs) This is Universal's extraordinary motion picture version of Peter Benchley's best-selling novel, Jaws. I just found out that a girl got killed here last week. And you knew it. You knew there was a shark out there. You knew it was dangerous. But you let people go swimming anyway. Barracuda. Everybody says, huh? What? You yell shark. We've got a panic on our hands on the 4th of July. Is it true that most people get attacked by sharks in three feet of water, about 10 feet from the beach? Yeah. What we are dealing with here is a perfect engine, uh, an eating machine. We're not only going to have to close the beach, we're going to have to hire somebody to kill the shark. Bad fish. But I'll catch him and kill him. Did you hear your father? This shark, swallow you whole. You're going to need a bigger boat. That's a 20 footer. 25. Three tons of them. Hurry up, he's coming straight for us. Don't screw it up now. Don't wait for me. Now! Shoot! Hold it! Hurry! Pick it up! Rory! Oh! Hurry! Hurry! 
fantasies of evil and compare with the reality of Jaws. Roy Scheider, Robert Shaw, Richard Dreyfus, Jaws. See it before you go swimming. So, man, I watched the trailer. It's the first time I've probably watched the original trailer. Movie looks terrible if you watch the trailer. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's like, wow, it really looks like they're hiding how bad this movie is. Yeah. Because all the screaming and shots are all like just stuff where they get caught up in the ropes ah, yeah. or stuff on the boat breaks. Yeah. I'm like, oh, no. It doesn't show the shark at all in the trailer, which, what? you know, is kind of indicative of the actual movie. But my wife almost couldn't watch this movie last night because um, because she had to deal with floaters last night in the bathtub. Little, little, little girl, little girl pooped in the bath. Laughed too hard, pooped in the bathtub. It's not safe to go back in the water. Dun 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 dun. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Uh, David, David, <laughs> David, like, need your help in the bathtub. David, I need your help. And then she was like, "Oh my god, ew, David, ew." <laughs> but you're like, "Sorry, honey, duty calls. <laughs> duty, I've got." <laughs> Uh, higher duty calls. Uh-huh. I got to watch Jaws for the fifteenth time before we <laughs> talk. <laughs> I have to. It uh, was such a pleasure to watch Jaws. I know. Yeah. It's, it's so great. Um. So yeah, Jaws can be found on HBO Max as of this recording. Also, Hulu and Amazon Prime. It is available everywhere right now. If you pay for HBO Max, or or oh. I, I think I think it says it's available on Amazon Premium subscription or Hulu Premium subscription. I'll, I'll check means. and get back to you. <clears throat> I check, but I was I'm pretty sure, unless there was like a very like suspicious button to try to get the free version. Oh, good news! Hulu now has a watch party option. Oh yeah, it's the same one. It's Teleparty. Oh, cool! You can watch on Teleparty the same one we use for Netflix party you can use on HBO, Disney Plus or Hulu. Yeah, speaking of which, uh if you guys don't know, um you should you should definitely join that Facebook group we were talking about earlier because every second Saturday of every month we have a watch party where we get together with fans of the show. We have a and we all stream a movie together and there's a chat room in the watch party and so we all kind of chat and make fun of the movie and you know, talk. It's a fun time. So join that group. Yeah, last weekend we watched The Crazies. It's the first time I saw it, and it's a great movie. We we got to cover that one someday. Oh, the 2010 one, the remake. Yep. Yeah, I think that still had his. Um, I think that still had uh, who Carpenter's uh, opinion, or uh, they still had his. Oh no, not Carpenter. Uh, the um, George A. Romero's. Uh, Input because mm. he did the original and and they they brought him back to th- think he, think J- Romero died in seventeen something like that so just kind of caught the yeah. tail end of him yeah. yeah you were right you do need an HBO subscription to view it on Hulu or Amazon yeah but you can rent it pretty much anywhere yeah you know as one does it'll be on Amazon or Netflix in the next couple months I'm sure yeah um. So Jaws is about the origins of one of the most popular James Bond henchmen. We learn about how he gained his signature steel teeth and brute strength in this emotional coming of age tale. Oh, wait. Is that not what? Is that not the Jaws you watched? No, I watched a movie about a um a giant killer shark off the coast of Massachusetts. Oh, Jaws. Oh yeah. Oh, oh. I see what you did. Okay, the shark film by that up and comer Steven Spielberg. Okay, I've seen that. Right. We can talk about that instead. Um, yeah, that's... Um, boy, that's that's kind of embarrassing. Yeah. That movie is based on the Peter Benchley novel of the same name about a huge killer great white shark terrorizing the island community of Amity. Jaws is Jaws. Right. It's, it's pretty much the shark movie every other shark movie is compared to, and for good reason, it's the best one. Not only the shark movie that every other shark movie is compared to. Pretty much the best monster movie. It's pretty much the best monster movie. It may be 
It's almost the best slasher, too. I mean, it's it like... may be the best slasher. <laughs> it may be also the best horror movie. <laughs> it's not ever on lists, you know? It's, it's People don't... Uh, so perfectly prolific in its ability to capture all of the elements of what makes a good movie, a horror movie, a mm-hmm. slasher movie, mm-hmm. a, a water movie, a uh-huh. shark movie, a... Like, it's just... This is a movie's movie. Yeah. Um... There's many imitators, but none live up to its example. This film is great at portraying a known but not fully respected actual killing machine. Uh, But what makes the movie great is the skill of the direction and the great acting of the principal cast. Um, Again, I mean, this really relies on the main three guys. I mean, Roy Scheider, Richard Dreyfuss, and... and, um, Shit. I, I... uh, Roy Scheider. He's the, Richard, he was the name that I'm and normally. Robert Shaw. Robert, Robert Shaw. Shaw. Gosh, yeah. Robert Shaw is usually one I remember out of all of them. Um, they're so fantastic together as as a cast, and the characters are strong. But really, I mean, this is the first real major motion picture outing by Steven Spielberg. I think he did. Was it Overdrive? Um, a, a, he, a theatrical release, or was that like a? I think that was like a TV movie. I was looking into this last night um, because, well, because it interested me tremendously. Um, but here, I'll, I'll look it up. You keep going, and then or I'll... no, it wasn't. It wasn't Overdrive. It's it was a um... Bachman Turner Overdrive. What was that movie called with the truck that I've never actually seen? <laughs> Fucking the truck. Yeah. You've given me so little to go off. You know, that movie with the fucking truck. Well, I mean, just look up Steven Spielberg's IMDb. It'll what, be the first what, one. What are you so stupid? Yeah, I'm getting there. It's just it's just taking me a minute. Anyways, so, and this is basically the origin of the summer blockbuster. Do you know how hard it is to pull up Steven Spielberg's IMDb, IMDb on your phone? <laughs> the app is like struggles under the a tremendous girth <laughs> of his uh, everything that he's done. It's like, <laughs> It's like what everything he's you want everything, um, yeah. So he did Sugar Land. So there were some feature lengths before this, but this was obviously his first blockbuster feature length. Um, he did uh, Duel. Duel. That's the one I was thinking right. Of. That's the one that people think of. He also did Something Evil and The Sugarland Express, um, which The Sugarland Express uh, I've heard lots of good things about, and huh. it has a decent. Decent ratings, but then once once he hits Jaws, then Spielberg really hits his stride. Yeah. I mean, that in two years later, so he goes he goes Jaws in seventy five, and then Close Encounters in seventy seven, nineteen forty one, Indiana Jones, and it just keeps rolling out. E. T. Yeah. Twilight Zone. I started Twilight Zone last night. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's got Dan Aykroyd at the start. It's great. Yeah, uh, so anyway. I haven't seen that one. That one's got probably the most tragic behind the scenes. Story. Oh. You you don't know what happened on Twilight Zone? Did Dan Aykroyd go crazy on Twilight Zone? <laughs> no. A couple of people died from a helicopter accident. Oh, shit. Yeah. And you can, there's like, you can find it on YouTube. It's horrifying. Jesus. Yeah. I don't want to find it. It's one. like a, the, probably one of, if not the worst, like, stunt movie accident failure Oof. um on film Man, how do you how do you bounce back from that yeah that's pretty rough um okay so what score do you give Joss? <laughs> oh uh oh <laughs> i mean that's uh, you give your synopsis and review yeah. uh yeah yeah i mean this is the easiest yeah. I, I mean the easiest 10 i've ever given maybe yeah. next to alien uh i hold this right next to alien in terms of like top tier yeah. favorite movies like this is yeah it's a great movie yeah it's 10 out of 10 yeah i i can't take anyone seriously that doesn't love St- steven spielberg it's like it's so here we go it, it's such Buckle like a lot a film snob thing to be like oh steven spielberg he's so overrated it's like okay (laughs) what's wrong with him he makes good movies he's just nothing but nothing but good movies like just nothing but engaging movies with genuine moments of (laughs) of human struggle and and uh you know 
interrelation interrelational drama with uh you know the the victory of the human spirit <laughs> get out of here with that what an idiot bullshit just like just all right david 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 <laughs> yeah i mean he's i'm unapologetic about saying like steven spielberg's probably my favorite director I mean, who, who comes in second or, or who's on that I mean, top three list? There's my there's my film nerd list of like, these are the ones that I really look forward to watching anything that they put out, mm-hmm. which is like Tarantino, um, P.T. Anderson, um, top three, Darren Aronofsky. Yeah. Um, I mean, the the Coen brothers. I mean, yeah. all of all of them. Are, so you've hit two of my two of my three which is aronofsky and the coen brothers uh-huh. like uh and then spielberg is probably the other one yeah but i mean in terms of like reliability and just oh a banger every time yeah you mean? banger every time yeah, like yeah. there's so few that you can point to and be like mm, it's yeah, okay. even the films that he didn't necessarily do, he's still known for, like Gremlins and uh, Poltergeist. You know? right. It's like, it's like, oh, that's a real Spielberg, Spielbergian mm-hmm. film, and it's like, oh, Toby Hooper did Poltergeist, right? But, but, yeah, did he? but Spielberg was there every day and kind of drove the ship, and Hooper was kind of like, yeah, I just kind of like sat back and watched Spielberg do this thing. I really like chainsaws. <laughs> Have you seen a chainsaw before? Yes, thank you, Toby. <laughs> uh, so, anyways, so, yeah. easy ten out of ten. Easy ten out of ten. Okay, well, let's uh, talk briefly about. The sponsors that love us, and yeah. we love them. Yeah, you guys, if you would like to help out the show, you c- you don't have to just uh, uh, pony up and become a patron or buy a sticker on our on our horror movie talk shop um, on our website. You can also uh, it would be really appreciated if you helped out our sponsors because they help out us. Mm-hmm. So support for horror movie talk is brought to you by Manscaped. Who is the best in men's below-the-waist grooming? Big news. Manscaped just released their new cologne scent to help you feel good and smell good all over and at all times. Who knew smelling good could feel this good? Manscaped is trusted by over 2, two million men worldwide. <laughs> 20 billion men. 2 million men worldwide. <laughs> Join the movement for all your below-the-waist grooming needs. We've talked about Manscaped before. It's a great product. I just had to re-up my Manscaped cleanser. I can't get enough. I like the soap. You just get one quick squirt of the mm-hmm. soap. You hit the pits. You hit the balls. You hit the scrum. And then uh, and then you're off. Mm-hmm. You're off to the races. Right. Yeah. And you it's, should probably use water, too. It's but. shampoo, too. Yeah, I don't... You know, I'm not into the rinsing off part. You get it all... You get it all in there and... Why it, rinse it off? It just keeps cleaning if you leave it in. You're like a big, dirty raccoon, David. <laughs> <laughs> um... Yeah, I mean, it's. Uh, they sent us the perfect package 3.0, I think it was. Yep. So you get you get underwear that are great underwear. You get a shirt that's a great shirt. You get these these uh, uh, shaving mats that are disposable, and you can just shave onto the mats. And then you get the lawnmower 3.0, the cleanser. You get the ball toner, and you get the ball preserve the crop preserver. Mm-hmm. So you get a ton of stuff, and, uh, and, and oh, and you get a little you get a little bag to carry it all in where you, when you're going on trips and shit. Yeah, I mean, I'm not normally a person that like actually takes care of themselves, right? Or you know, could have fooled me. And <laughs> you're like a big dirty raccoon. Kid. But you know, there's something about like going through the effort of moisturizing and perfuming and. Like, doing all that stuff that makes you feel real good. Yeah, and they just came out with their signature scent. Yeah. Um, So, please go to manscaped.com and use code HMT at checkout to get 20% off and free shipping. That's right. So, that's 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com when you use code HMT. Look good, smell good, feel good with Manscaped. One of our newer sponsors is Night Channels. Um, you know that feeling 
of flipping through LPs and finding that incredible record that blows your mind and creeps your family out, or catching a bizarro low-budget horror movie on public access that makes you wonder what you just watched? Enter Night Channels, a weirdo thrill-seeker's goldmine, a truly independent shop stuffed with killer shirt designs that celebrate the mutant media nerd that's hiding in all of us. Whether you dig into the subhumanoid fringes of popular and underground music, cult literature, and brain-battering horror and sci-fi films, Night Channels brings you the shirts and hoodies you never thought existed at very affordable prices. If you've ever wondered where that maniac that you met at the basement show got his Neuromancer t-shirt, it's time to flip to Night Channels. Yeah, so I, I got myself a, uh, a Mayhem t-shirt off of nightchannels.com. Right. And, uh, oh, man, I love it. It's yeah. great. How did, how did we find the sponsor? Did we tell that story? Um, no, I, I've this forgotten. Is, this is one of those where it's like we were patrons of them yeah, before I, yeah, I was, we approached them. Because you saw like a, an ad on Facebook, and you're like, oh, God damn, I kind of need that shirt. I kind of need that fucking shirt. Oh, shit, I need that shirt, too. They had an Akira shirt which uh, with, with just the bomb going off in, in, the, in Neo Tokyo. And I was like... God damn, that's a fucking cool shirt. Oh, it's a sweatshirt too. And then I was like, "Oh shit, they're in Portland." So yeah. I reached out to them, and um, and they were happy to uh, to hop on the show. So please do support Night Channels. You know, if your dad's poor right now, David, dad's poor right now. Then uh, then this place is a great place to shop because HMT at checkout gets you thirteen percent off an already really Actually, low. It's- is it HMT? Okay, yeah, that's right. It's HMT. I thought it was. Yeah, I did too f- for some reason. But HMT gets you thirteen percent off these already really low prices for pretty, pretty uh, obscure t-shirt designs. You you haven't right. seen these before, so right. yeah, check them out. That's at nightchannels.com. That's right, just like it's spelled nightchannels.com. Code HMT at checkout for thirteen percent off. And if you want to just give us your money. We always have Patreon. Yeah, we do. And and it's not just giving us your money. We also got a, a whole other podcast over there that we've been doing for getting close to two years now called The Afterpod, where we just leave the ri- mics running. And, you know, there's all kinds of uh, stuff. Oh, you do, if, if you're a Patreon at the $6.66 tier right now, you wouldn't be listening to this commercial because we cut the commercials out of our early release podcast. Uh, podcasts that mm-hmm. we that we release early mm-hmm. on uh, on patreon so yeah check it out patreon.com slash horror movie talk there's a bunch of different tiers and we want to thank our new patrons we're, we kind of have a backlog we've we've been recording so many in advance that we don't know when we're going to actually release the episodes yeah now i know we're going to release this this week we've got a big blockage of <laughs> patrons and there's a blockage Except imagine it's not shit, right. but it's like just the best people in the world. Right. You got to replace the uh, you got to replace the mush with something a little bit more <laughs> yeah, high quality. <laughs> okay. Uh, so please and thank you to Amber G, Blair D, Ruby, Laura F, Ines R, Craig T, Amy S, Anasaurus. <laughs> Jen M and Alyssa for joining our ranks Patreon. We love you guys. It really, really helps us out. And if you if you become a patron, you get a bunch of you know horror movie talk stickers and a thank you card that uh, that I sign and uh, and then I, I write Bryce's name in there usually wrong and mm-hmm. and it's usually at his expense. Right. Whatever joke I say is exactly he gets made fun of. And I think we already mentioned our. Our shop on our website, but horrormovietalk.com slash shop. Yep. Is that right? Yep. Um, if you want to buy a t-shirt with the logo on it or any of our stickers, you can check us out there. Also check out our resident artist, Dustin Goble, a professional artist who fucks hard. He also takes commissions for artwork for an HMT fan. And every once in a while, we get one dropped on the Facebook group of, of a, a listener that commissioned him. Mm-hmm. And it always looks awesome. Yeah. And it's always like a custom job where it's integrating their favorite horror movie and maybe their friend that they're buying the artwork for yeah did you see that scream one lately yeah that was awesome 
Yeah. That's awesome. That was awesome. <laughs> so contact him at dgobel 0 on Instagram. That's at D-G-O-E-B-E-L-0-0 on Instagram. And to make your artistic dreams come true, tell him HMT sent you. Also, if you want to leave us a voicemail, call 682-253-4468. Thanks again for listening. Let's get into spoilers. Look, I know you guys think I'm, you know, retarded or whatever, but... <laughs> Spoilers. Okay. Okay. This is something that you already know. Okay. But, uh, and of course, I also knew um, a lot. You know, I knew this all the way. Uh, the whole thing. I knew all of it. So there's no question about whether or not I knew it. Okay. But uh, have you seen, by any chance, John Williams' track record? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I re- always remember this bringing up, and I was like, "Yeah, music by John Williams, and he's amazing." And you're like, "John who?" Well, I, I'm like, I knew it. John, like I, the no. Name we and- I prefaced this very specifically to tell you that I already knew all right, this very, exactly very uh-huh, much. Uh-huh. I knew it. So let's list off some of John Williams' greatest hits. Unbelievable! Unbelievable! Okay, so we got Jaws, obviously the, you almost can't get more iconic than Jaws. Right. It's, he, he, he's the composer for all of these that I'm about to name. Right. You can't, it, it's the most iconic composition for a movie ever, mm-hmm. ever. Every, every movie theme that you think of. In the last, like, 30 years, like, that you can be like, oh, yeah, that's, like, an iconic theme right. in film. It's John Williams. A much more niche niche person who is kind of an up-and-comer over the last 15 years, Trent Reznor has scored more movies than you can possibly imagine, and he does a great job at it Yeah, he's as well. great. He's, yeah. Anyway, so, uh, so you got Jaws, Star Wars, A New Hope... <laughs> Close Encounters of the Third Kind, of course, Jaws 2, <laughs> Superman, 1941, all the Star Wars, all of the Star Wars, Superman 2, the Richard Donner cut, mm-hmm. <laughs> Indiana Jones, all of the Indiana, E.T., Indiana Jones. all of the Indiana Jones, right, um, he did The Witches of Eastwick, he did... Uh, Born on the 4th of July, he did Presumed Innocent, Home Alone, Hook, JFK, Far and Away, Jurassic Park. Another totally iconic composition. Schindler's Fist. Um, (laughs) I mean, it just goes on and on. Amistad, Saving Private Ryan, uh, The Phantom Menace. This man is untouchable. Catch me if you can. He also did. Oh, I mean... It's just it's just banger after banger. Minority Report, <clears throat> Harry Potter and the Chambers, all the Harry Potter movies, The Terminal, um, Memoirs of a Gay. I mean, there's so few. There's like, I looked. Up, there's only like two or three names that you can even like come close to mentioning in the same sentence as John Williams, and they're not Hans, even close. Hans Zimmer is yeah. Hans Zimmer. Hans Zimmer is the other one. Yeah. But it's like if you put them up against each other, you're like, okay, but this isn't this isn't really the same thing. That's like that's that set the stage for all slasher music, all of it. Yeah, I mean, I would say Psycho is probably oh, good point. That point, but um, good point. But yeah, I think I think all slasher or even just horror movie music is kind of rooted in the um, the twentieth century um, oh, classical music stuff. So like Penderecki and and uh, of course like uh, Dvorak and well, that's not even a good example. Um, I also enjoy fine wine. And- I'm trying. I'm trying to think of some of the other. Some of the other composers. This actually, since we're talking about the theme, um, it, rem- it John Williams is 
an expert at stealing stuff and making it his sure, own. Sure, like yeah. definitely, like all the greats are. If you if you are a, a, a classical music, you know, aficionado, aficionado, you'll definitely be able to pick of out like, oh, okay, he he stole a lot of stuff whole cloth from Holst. So, like, oh. if you listen to the planets, you'll hear definitely themes from Star Wars. Schindler's in, List. In, in that. Um, also, like, Jaws is very reminiscent of um, the Rite of Spring. Mm. Um, I pulled a, an excerpt from this, and you tell me um, if you hear any kind of similarities. No, sir, I don't see it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when John Williams made this theme, um, I mean, it's so simple. I mean, especially the opening notes. It's literally just a halftone repeated. And he he basically um, wrote it thinking he wanted to make something very primitive, something like very, um, you know, reminiscent of... Primacy, <laughs> okay, of the primitive, and that's actually like basically what the Rite of Spring is too. It's like a, that that song was that uh, movement was from like the dance of the young women or something. And Rite of Spring is basically about a like human sacrifice. I think sexy um, midsummer. So we're getting into mm-hmm. some midsummer stuff here. A slash Wicker Man. So it's like, um, I mean, it really feels like something ancient mm-hmm. and just primal. Um, and it fits so well with this movie. And it basically, if you think of Jaws, you're really thinking about that music. Yeah. Like, because Steven Spielberg, um, smartly showed the shark as little as possible. Right. This is another great example of don't show anything because right. it's better if you don't. Um, there's a lot of insinuation in this movie a lot of it mm-hmm. where um you know for example when uh when richard dreyfus is performing the autopsy on the first girl victim uh-huh. uh the skinny dipper it doesn't show anything it doesn't show anything you don't get to see any part of it but you see his reaction you see his reaction and everyone else's reaction and he's describing it and he's describing it exactly and it and it works it's you may have what you may it's almost it's well it's definitely worse than having actually seen it because if you'd just seen it it would not have been as impressive as Richard Dreyfuss's performance being shocked right. as a medical professional who's getting not not good vibes off of this whole thing who's shocked to shit yeah and i don't think there's anything scarier than the unknown and that's right. that's really what is communicated so well in all of the like attacks right where if you you're kind of afraid of the ocean, right? Aren't aren't you one of those people that kind of like is real uneasy? Yeah, I'll go about- in it. I'll go in it for sure. Um, it's just there is a f- there is a feeling where if I focus on it, I get I wig myself out really. Yeah, uh, I can spin out of control pretty good on it, which is this abyss below you. Yeah, like this feeling of just a lot of nothing below you, right? And the potential of something in that nothing, right? I I really tapped into you when I wrote the uh, the opening ad. I, oh, yeah. I was really thinking about you because to me, I'm like, well, I'm first of all, I'm very fat, so that means I'm very buoyant. I have nothing to worry about. I could just lie back and be like, the all right, worry I'm fine. is not sinking into the ocean. The worry is. What's underneath you? What's underneath you? But all, yeah, I guess, I guess it's a bit of a fear of heights as well. Yeah, yeah. But you're, you're not going to down gonna fall though. Okay, but like if you were to go into outer space, right? You know, it's the same kind of like, oh shit, there's everything around me. You know, it's like there's everything and nothing in all directions. Right. It's just a, it's an overwhelming infinity feel. Right. I mean, d- don't get me wrong. If you're stranded at sea, just yourself and no boat or something, that you're gonna die like you're you're pretty shit out of luck because the odds of someone even seeing you are nil mm. um but 
to me, like the, the Except whole for those sharks with their soulless <laughs> dead eyes, <laughs> doll eyes, black eyes, like daughter's eyes. Then they come at you and they're lifeless until they eyes roll into the back of their head. Okay. Roll back and you see the whites of their eyes. And... Anyway, yeah, no, there's definitely um, there's so, definitely a lot going on that's just like the the fear of like the abyss right. and the unknown and like what just touched my leg kind of thing. It doesn't I mean the touch my leg thing kind of bothers me. I mean, who, mm. who's not How could it not? But I mean a lot of the kind of unknown and dreadful aspects of the ocean like doesn't really do much for me. Yeah. But this movie really taps into that. It's really about like it's underneath you. Right. The thing that you can't see. And uh, it never shows it, which is great because if they actually did show the shark approaching people in mm-hmm. any of the kills, it would have undercut it. Undercut not only the kill, but also all of the fake outs that Spielberg does throughout. Where and the one or two where you do see the shark. Right. In the, it, like in the uh, you know in the big crowds of people, is this a three act movie? It feels like a three act movie to me. It feels like well, yeah. I mean, most acts, most movies are three acts. Right. It might actually be four. In, uh, yeah, I, don't know. I think it's. I think it's. There's the start, and then there's the middle where they're <laughs> looking for the for, for the inclination to go out in the water slash get the get the um, the uh, the boat captain to go do it yeah. and then there's the final it's kind of like a three act movie and then the third act has three acts is what I would say yes yeah that's true it is a little split up in that third act yeah because it it almost feels like a different movie when right it's you're like, on the land versus when they're actually on the boat yeah there's a lot of like little triumphs that uh, that the that the composer uh John Williams does does little like jaunty things uh-huh. for it's like oh we we nailed him we got the we got the spear in his in his body and now he's he's carrying a barrel and we can watch him and then it's like oh and then oh shit it can take the barrel down he can't take down two barrels no oh, one can take down two barrels he's taking down three barrels he took down two barrels <laughs> mm. <laughs> concern mm, rising fuck uh yeah, so I mean that's I mean the the big takeaways is like the success of using a musical theme to communicate. Right. And then second is not showing anything. Right. And communicating it through like camera movement. Camera movement, acting and storytelling. Great storytelling. So a great example of that is the story we just referenced where the captain is telling uh the de- or the sheriff and and uh Richard Dreyfus, the most annoying actor on earth, uh about his his tenure on the the vessel that was sunk Indianapolis. the in, in Indianapolis that was sunk in what Japanese waters sure and shark infested um, waters and uh, and that scene is incredible yeah and it's just a man telling a story uh, but you get you get a full visual of the whole thing because it's such an incredible story of and it it builds the character of Quint right like it's like oh. Oh, he's I not get just why con- your why your boathouse has fucking a thousand shark jaws around right. it because now you're out for revenge. Yeah, because fuck those sharks. Jaws to the revenge. So, uh, was it Jaws two that was the revenge? I don't know. I think it was like Jaws four. <clears throat> yeah, I think what was it? There's Jaws, Jaws two, Jaws three D, and then I think Jaws the Revenge was the one, and it had uh, Michael Caine in it. Okay. Anyways, yeah, you know, you know how they blow up the shark at the end of this movie. Spoilers. Yeah, that shark comes back for revenge in the fourth movie. <laughs> Wait, it does. I think so. You've seen all the Jaws? No, I haven't. Oh. I haven't seen any of them, but the first one. But I, I, I remember hearing that the plot of Jaws: The Revenge is like beyond ridiculous because it involves like the original shark getting revenge somehow. Oh. I think I don't know. That's don't 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 quote me on that. Um, so, how- but I, I do know that Michael Caine like disavows that movie as like <laughs> god awful. Um, how does 
So, th- so Jaws kind of starts off with a drunken party on the beach and a girl who goes skinny dipping. Right. This opening, there's, it's so weird to think about this movie because there's so many parts that I think of independently mm-hmm. and almost don't fit together. It's such a different swing and tone between this movie and the opening is like a set piece. Right. And it works on its own. Right. Which is, yeah, just like a drunken party. It's like almost out of any slasher movie, you know drunken girl and boy is like hey let's go skinny dipping and then they go um out on the ocean and she like you know romps in there and you know pretty good uh you know nice nice skinny dipping scene i, mm-hmm. I must say yeah very D- tasteful tastefully done um celebrates the the female body in mm-hmm. a, a very sex positive way and <laughs> <laughs> listen bryce i listen I believe that the future is female, and anyone who says otherwise can suck my fat dick. (laughs) (laughs) Ehrlich Bachman. All right. If you want to leave us a review, podcast again is Horror Movie Podcast. Right. (laughs) Um, So... What was I going to say? Oh, yeah. So, so she I romps mean, out into the water she and she's out. splashing around. And dude guy who's who's supposed to be out there chasing her is uh, is too inebriated and right. basically falls asleep just at the edge of the beach. And, the, and, and, it's, and it's great cinema, cinematography, even in this kind of throwaway initial scene where he's laying down with a with a knee up and the and the waves are just just coming halfway up his body and and his silhouette is that it's just a yeah very good cinematography and man when that fucking thing hits her and she starts screaming that's one of the most jarring yeah and insane scream queen scenes that has ever been caught on film and it's so it's so um understated really yeah i mean until until the scream where it, it's like bloop <laughs> she, she just gets Pulled under the water a little bit. Right. And bloop. And then she's like, what the fuck? Bloop. Bah! <laughs> just absolute scream. And, and then it's just it's just gone. Yeah. Just the scream is gone because she's pulled under the water. And it's like, holy shit. It really puts a nail in the cop. Yeah. And then, and then the next day. Before, before we move on. Okay. I, uh, something hit me. Like, the lesson learned here is like. I don't know. What is the lesson learned here? I walked away and I was like, I would, I'm just resolved never to drink so much that I won't be able to fuck some lady mm. that is offering, you know, to go skinny dipping in the water. Well, I mean, you're, but at the same time, in if your I, situation is kind of a numbers game. If you I wasn't play the number, <laughs> if I wasn't drunk, then I'd be probably attacked by a shark. <laughs> Touche. So, oh man. We have a real debacle here. I mean, which which way is it? That's a good question. And then the other question is, can you be... I mean, the, the answer must be yes, but what? like, can you be so drunk that, you know, an offer of sex would just be like, uh... Yes, the answer is yes. I can tell you a, re- a resounding yes. <laughs> Man, that's. it feels like I would... The Bryce impulse. is Bryce is next Mormon who has nearly ever been drunk, so uh, forgive his <laughs> ignorance on this. I feel like my my libido would overcome any inebriation. You are incorrect, sir. You are incorrect. It and and there and it is, and the depending on the level of drunkenness you are, it is it's di- there can be a there's a sweet spot where it's just torture. Where it's just like, go, go, Dick, go, please, go. And it just won't. It's like, oh. All right. Oh. But if you're if you're too far on the other side of that, then it's just... <laughs> it's just like, I barely know what's going on. Right. What are you doing? Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> so anyways. Um, so, so yeah, then the, the next day, she's discovered... Right, she's discovered, and uh, by by the sheriff, and um, and uh, and as they approach the body, there's a bunch of little crabs all over the body. Right, and uh, and so I I was thinking, I was thinking this was kind of like a, a, a 
CSI Miami scene where <laughs> where he walks up and he takes off and he he takes off his glasses and he's like, looks like she's got a killer case of crabs. <laughs> <laughs> no? Okay. Uh, <laughs> the one trivia thing I read about this is that originally the arm that they take out of the sand you was... You didn't like that at all. It was great. Okay. It was fantastic. Um, the arm that they took out of the sand was a fake arm, and Steven, no. <laughs> Steven Spielberg thought it looked too fake, so the actual arm in the film... Cut off the act- from the actress. No, it was an actual arm. Uh- a cadaver arm? No, like someone was buried in the sand. Oh, like a film, film deal assistant or something is buried in the sand, and then they pull the arm out of the sand, and it's all bloodied and stuff. But that's just it's still attached to someone, which is also shows you how successful <laughs> this movie is communicating at what it's trying to show you, and how much you can overcome, you know, just from the framing of the shot. Because oh, yeah. to everyone that watches it, you just assume like, okay, well, that's a detached arm. Right. You know? Right. Um, and yeah, just the... <sighs> well, there is a part where it is fully detached, where they pick it up and it's like, this is an arm. Yeah, I think in the autopsy scene, Richard uh, Dreyfus. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That must be what I'm thinking about. Um, so, yeah, that, that opening scene is so iconic and great. And then... Um, the the rest of the movie really lives up to it. I right. think it's oh, like yeah. what, and there's very similar. The kills in this movie are very similar, but they all like hit so right, and it's paced out. It's really perfectly. it's really paced out perfectly. And a lot of people, you know, okay. So if you're jaded on this movie and you've seen it a bunch of times, then there might be an argument to be made for. Um, oh, it slows down in the middle too much. You know, there's just a lot of talk. It kind of it kind of falls in a little bit into that um, drive uh, that drive in movie theater trap of um, the talking. Uh-huh. You know, where it's just like make out. <laughs> stuff I, I can tell you watch the review yeah, of the blob i by did letter media <laughs> yeah yeah but it's a but it's i mean it's it's a it is a an a, a relic of a bygone era right where that is definitely something i remember from watching all those movies from the 50s and right. 60s and 70s that are just kind of filler in the middle and then the thing uh, you right. know the blob uh, the fly and and so but in but you would be wrong in jaws because they consistently deliver right like yeah there's some talk and there's some character building that's you know it's a little slow but then they'll sprinkle in a kill you know yeah i mean that that's the thing that i was talking about before where it feels like a couple different movies so right. one is the opening scene mm-hmm. the second is anything on land mm-hmm. like in the town and then the third is on the boat uh-huh. like that's and they're they're so like you know separated by you know the the moment it's in and you think like the the least interesting out of all of them is when they're on land and like it they're dealing with the town you would think that for sure but you'd be wrong you'd be a foolish fool yes thank you brendan you're welcome um, <laughs> it's uh I mean, yeah, if you if you watch it, you realize like, oh, wait, th- this whole spot is really compelling. And that's why the film is successful, because it's none of it really is boring because it's so well paced to where, you know, it, it makes you realize like, oh, this moves a lot faster than I remember. Right. Even though it is two hours and 15 minutes long, a long movie. Yeah. Um, like it. The first thing after we see like the, the woman killed on the beach is is a. Uh, the boy brody is like oh well we got to close down the beaches right like i thought that was later kind of thing but he like immediately yeah is gonna make signs and then of course kind of the story of the of these first two acts is the mayor and like the businesses putting pressure on like well we can't close down the beaches it's so this is our lifeblood. Ruin, yeah, it's the lifeblood. We'll, we're a summer town. We re- rely on tourists. Yeah, this is Amity, Massachusetts, by the way. So mm-hmm. it's uh, right next to it's on the Cape in there in Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. And so, it's an island, actually. So they, they tempt fate, and um, the mayor convinces Brody 
wow. to not close the beach. And he says, like, we'll just call it, you know, she was, we won't say it's a shark it's a bite. It's a tragic boating accident. It's a tragic accident. boating accident. <laughs> <laughs> Refer to our sleepaway camp episode for more tragic boating accident jokes. Yeah, so they they tempt fate, and then there's the first beach scene, which is chock full of fake outs. Tons of fake outs in this one. It's it's just um, so so. Wait a minute. So explain how there's a bunch of. Fake outs in, in this. You, yeah, you, yeah. Thanks, Brandon. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I... It, it's well established that that Brody knows that there's still a danger out there, but he's convinced by the mayor that, like, don't worry. I mean, what are the odds? What are the, well, look how big the ocean is. Look at it. It's, it's not going to happen again. Um, and so he's sitting there. He's not, like, the lifeguard, but he's sitting there with his family just attentively watching the ocean and there's not even that many people it's like this it's the town's folks um there before like the tourists come right and so every like couple seconds there's another fake out and it ramps up over time where right. it's like it's like uh, <laughs> someone someone's creeping oh someone got pulled under the water oh, oh no oh it's someone putting his just girlfriend some, on his shoulder someone just horsing around yeah like oh uh, oh no someone's flopping oh, around in the water oh, oh they're just having fun there they're just like, uh, this is this is by the way a window into my mind <laughs> like, yeah this is how my I every day goes for me I'm like oh, uh, what was that oh, oh what was that sound <laughs> oh, okay and there's a couple I mean this is still pretty early on in Spielberg's directing career but it's so strong in scenes like this where you realize the skill of how good of a storyteller he is through ca camera movement and how much is like kind of filled because it pulls your attention or like, like keeps you, um, in this scene, it keeps you like off kilter of like, what's, what's going on. Mm -hmm. And there's just little touches. Like there's this one shot where, um, it's following kind of an overweight woman going into the water and then it starts fixating on this child that comes out of the water. And so it's like just showing how many people are on the beach and how many moving parts there are. Um, yeah, it's hard to put your finger on of like, what is he? I mean, I'm not like a, a film student and I don't like know all of the techniques and what everything's called. But you definitely know when you're watching a Spielberg movie like this is very well um, it's the build up payoff. Built. Yeah. It's yeah, he's constantly he's constantly queuing up the next build up and then and then giving you a payoff. But he does it in a deft way. Right. Um yeah, because I mean because he intersperses it with so much in this one, he intersperses it with so much like uh sleight of hand where it's like, well, is it this or is it that? Mm -hmm. or is it this or is it that? Yeah. So anyways, um the the shark attacks another victim. Mm -hmm. It's actually a little child, and then everyone's like screaming and running back to the beach. And then you you have the scene. Well, where the first first he gets attacked, and they're like everybody out of the water. In which point, at which point, everybody runs into the water. <laughs> Like the whole beach runs into the water to get their kids, right? Yeah. So, so it was like uh, I was pretty high while watching this, and so I was, <laughs> I was saying to my wife, "Everybody into the water! In every everybody, there's a shark. We have to overwhelm it with force. He can't take all of us. <laughs> do as the bees do when they're attacked. Suffocate the shark. <laughs> Just start vibrating. Uh, <laughs> let's overheat the shark." Um, so, yeah, and then it's like it really hits you in the feels when this mother Ugh. walks out and she she can't find her son. And you realize, like, oh, it's her son that got killed. And which is like, it's just not left at that, you know, because that is the moment where, like, okay, the entire town knows now mm -hmm. that there's the shark and the, the entire town is sharing this tragedy. And, tragedy. And the mother um, puts up a bounty on the shark. Yeah. And uh, it's a terrible trilogy. Yeah. And then everyone you know is is in this town meeting. I want to speed through this. I mean, we've all seen Jaws. I mean, yeah. 
introduces Quint as one of the people that's like, I could get the shark, but I'm not going to shark. I'm not going to do it for no measly three thousand dollars. And then everyone in town and out of town comes in because there's like ads put in the newspapers that there's this bounty on the shark. And then a shark gets caught. Yeah, it's like a tiger shark or something. And everyone's very excited about it. And then that is when the mother, like, fully garbed out in, like, black mourning garb. Yeah, like, veil almost, and like, all. Like, almost Old Testament level mourning garb. And approaches the sheriff, Brody, and uh, slaps him in the face and basically says, like, I heard that you knew that there was, you know, a killer shark out there and you still open the beaches. Like, yeah. how dare you? Which is, like... It's right. Like, he he should feel very bad about that because he was pressured into doing something that he knew was wrong, not right. Right. So that really establishes the stakes for Brody, where it's like, I fucked up real hard the, on this. Yeah, and Brody is such a great character because he the audience really inhabits Brody. Right. You know, I mean... He's our, kind of our main character, mm-hmm. but, but and he's also his character is kind of a fish out of water because <laughs> he just he's recently came from like New York, yeah, to to be the sheriff here, yeah, and uh, and he he he's the easiest to empathize with because you're 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 following him and and his struggle, and you get you really get a sense of his struggle. Be- because of uh, uh, kind of the the quote boring parts of this movie, where he's sitting at the table with his son, and he's like, "Give me a kiss." And the kid's like, "Why?" And he's like, "I just need it." Right? Like I'm f- like shit's fucked right now. <laughs> right? And even the kid's like, "What? Why should I?" And he's like, "Come on, just help a brother out." Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I feel real bad for him. So, I mean, that really establishes the stakes, and that's when Richard Dreyfuss's character, Hooper, comes in. Hey, um, you guys! <laughs> and he basically reveals that mm, this is probably not the shark. Right. Like, it's not, it's jaws. Jaws aren't big enough um, <laughs> to be the shark that it attacked It said the, the name woman. of the movie! Um and then somehow, even after, like, the rebuke of the mother, the beach still gets open on the 4th of July. Right. Because of political pressure. Right. And, um, like, this is another great example of, of that, of, like, hubris or of politics getting in the way of safety. Yeah. You know? And uh, they open the beach another time, and this scene is very similar to the first scene, but the stakes are raised because it makes it a very good point of of all these establishing shots of these gigantic boats full of tourists right. coming to the island, and, and you're just like, oh, fuck. Yeah. Because, I don't know about you, but when, when I saw those giant boats, those giant ferries just filled to the brim with like people in swimsuits and <laughs> and towels are like all right let's go on the beach I'm like oh fuck this is not gonna end well um did that work for you i'm gonna be honest with you i barely remember oh, that okay. scene um i was i was really in love with hating richard dreyfus in this movie. okay yeah. i was really in love well with you that. know who else was in love with hating richard dreyfus oh Robert Shaw. Apparently, Robert Shaw and Richard Dreyfus did not get along in this you movie. You don't say. And, uh, yeah, they, they fought a lot on set, and that translated very well into the acting because they didn't like each other as characters. Robert either. Shaw strikes me as a an actor who fell into acting accidentally. Nope. Have you seen... I saw an interview with, with him after I watched this, and I was like, oh, oh. he's like... Just like an English actor. God damn! Yeah, what you see a, you know, it's basically like watching, you know, someone interview, you know, Peter Cushing or, or like, um, what's his name? That is really super. How did Nitwit like you get so tasteful? I can't remember who played Obi Wan Kenobi in the original Star Wars. Oh, um, yeah, old Ben. I guess. 
<laughs> I can't remember. But I mean, one of these like English actors of that yeah, yeah, generation, that where, it's like, well, obviously these people got started in Shakespeare. Like it's that kind of actor. Wow. He's and he goes. <laughs> so it makes it even more impressive that he's like the super salty. It feels like the guy is not acting. Right. Yes, exactly. Here, let me let me look it up. Anyway, that's imp- so they so they had a they had an actual beef on on the yeah. on the set. So this the second scene on the beach is great because all the town knows that like yeah, I mean a shark was caught but what if kind of thing. And um and then the mayor like makes it a point to go to like one of the council members He's like Go in the water. Yeah. Just, and the guy's like, well, I mean, I just put on some, go in the water. Yeah. Yeah. It's time for everyone to get in. And, um, uh, so they go. And, and that kind of gives, Carrie was a little confused about it. She's like, why does he want, he's just trying to get a tan. And the reason is peer pressure. Uh, right. You know, no one's in the water. Someone has to show that it's safe to go back in the water. Right. And um, it's it's the same reason if you're outside in a park playing alone by yourself right now during the age of covid and you don't have a mask on and then somebody walks into that park 100 yards away from you <laughs> and they have a mask on. You kind of go, oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. And then they look at you from 100 yards away and they're like, where's your fucking mask? And you're like, it's in my fucking pocket, asshole. Yeah, I don't. In that circumstance, I would not give a fuck. <laughs> Be like, we're outside. But as they approach you closer and closer, then the the eye, the stink eye, starts getting stronger and stronger. And then I go like, "Oh, you believe in that hoax?" <laughs> <laughs> wow. No, um, I believe in COVID nineteen. Well, you know. It's okay. Um, Wait, I I just can't. I, I can't w- believe that Bryce prefers doesn't believe in COVID nineteen. I was there at the Capitol, but I did not go inside. I'm not <laughs> one of those. <laughs> Um, so yeah, this scene, and then Brody makes it a point to tell his son, like, don't take your boat in the ocean. Go, go in like the, the little lake yeah. next to it or whatever. Don't go chasing waterfalls. Yeah. Don't so go chasing can, the waterfalls. Yeah, please stick to the rivers and the lakes that you're used to. And then there's a big fake out where, I mean, it, it sets up this whole beach is cram packed full of people. So it's like raises the stakes and then you, it does the whole like you know jaws theme and you see the fin out of the water and there's like people on boats with with guns that are waiting for it and then and then it's revealed that it's just some kids with a shark fin he told me to do it (laughs) that's a very spielbergian moment yeah that reveal of like oh it's just good fun and that's one of those things that people would look at and it's like oh that's so corny it's like well what's the alternative yeah like it's a great fake out. What's the alternative? They say nothing, and then it's just like, oh. no, it should have been a shark. It should have been the shark. Should have eat him. <laughs> You're missing the point of the fake out. Um, and then the shark goes into the little bay where where Brody's son the lake. is. The shark is going into the lake. And it's such it's such like a great and every single one of the kills like it does not pull any punches. It's like instantly the water is completely full with blood it's shocking it is shocking to me now i I sat there with my mouth open at most of these kills just being like holy fuck there's a fountain of blood shooting out of the ocean right which is which is true to how if you watch like sharks eating seals or something like that it is astonishing how much blood there is there's so much blood yeah um, it's just like that scene in Jurassic Park. Oh, so much blood. <laughs> that little boy's just like, oh man, look at, look at how much blood that goat came, came out of that goat. So at this point, impressive. You Perfect. know, um, Brody's son is like completely in shock because he literally like narrowly escaped death. Yeah. And then the mayor at this point, like sees him in the hospital and the mayor is finally shook. Cause yeah, the mayor's kids were in the water too. Yeah. And uh, it's like impossible not to hate this mayor. This mayor is like the biggest asshole. Yeah, you know. Yeah, he's a pretty big dick. Um, so finally, Brody just uh, forces the mayor to sign this paper to hire Quint 
for the amount of money that he was asking for. I was like, we got to kill this fucking shark. Let me uh, let me ask quick, quick, quick sidebar here. Did you notice a lot of uh, parallels with modern day COVID era uh, restrictions and stuff? Like they were trying to 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 infringe upon people's mm-hmm. right, but for good reason. Uh-huh. You know, there's a true public safety hazard, uh-huh. and then people. And even back then, in 1975, people were like, I can't go into the... I can't go sit on the... I can't... Do blah, blah, blah. So, this is how we've always been. It's like, we're here. We're queer. Get used to it. This is how it is. You know? I'm serious. It was so... There were so many parallels between COVID and the beach restrictions and Jaws. Right. That I was just like, oh, oh, we have always been this way. Look. Yeah, I mean, everyone... 50 years ago. Yeah, everyone knows that there's a huge danger, but also everyone doesn't want to change anything. Right. So they're (laughs) willing to, like, have... It's a numbers game. Fuck you. (laughs) Mass hysteria, mass psychosis of, like, we're fine. This is fine. It's because everybody thinks on an individual level, and on an individual level, the numbers game is good, up until it's not. (laughs) Right. (laughs) You know, like... (laughs) I mean, there's plenty of people to eat. I mean... Most of us will be safe. Right. And then the shark came for you, and there was no one left to eat but you. Um, have you ever read a Peter Benchley novel? Uh-uh. I've read one. I read The Beast, which is basically Jaws except with a giant squid. Oh. Um, it's weird how authors get, like, really... Into a lane. Into a lane yeah. of, like, Peter Benchley is ocean monster. <laughs> Well, you the know, novel. It's, it's probably a uh, tantamount to, you know, the the, you know, Picasso's blue phase. You know, they right. like everybody gets stuck on a thing for right. a while. You know, it's like artists get stuck on colors. But it, there's something writers get stuck on themes. There's something very compelling about how he writes and like it made me understand like, oh, OK, this is very interesting because it's something you don't know a lot about. Like, you know, of the existence of these, you know ocean predators Uh but you don't really appreciate you know how like uh sophisticated or how how like um perfect they are right for like killing and that really comes through in this movie like they pay a lot of respect to learning about sharks you know or at least like on i mean i'm sure there's a lot of like creative freedom and not you know super if you were going to ask, like, a marine biologist, they'd probably be like, yeah, there's not really much of a danger. Right. But in terms of painting a picture, this is really good at painting a picture of, like, no, this is, like, an eating machine of, like, ancient origin. Right. It's basically, like, a dinosaur that perfected itself thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago. And there's no reason to change, because it'll just eat, make more sharks, and you know poop and they will keep eating yeah that's true and um and oh geez i've already lost what i was gonna say and and that's kind of like the the point of the hooper character is to really like communicate that stuff and then show brody you know reading books about it and being like wow this it says like most of the shark attacks happen you know in like three feet of water is that true i'm like yep yeah because that's where people are (laughs) you're like jesus You, you get all this information where you're like oh this is not something that I realized was, like, always there. Like, right. there's always a threat of a shark eating you. As long as you're in the water. As long as you're in the water. Yeah. So, it sets up all that stuff great. And then, so after this second beach scene, um, Brody decides to hire Quint uh, to charter the boat. For Quint to, you know, get the shark because, you know, he's the saltiest sailor. And, you know, we know salty sailors can catch sharks. And, uh... That is that begins the third act, which is basically the movie. Like everything leading up to this point is leading you up to the actual boat right. part of the movie. Right. And you could just watch this part where they leave and have like an entire movie and be satisfied. Yeah. Um and it's a really good setup of like different um personalities clashing and working together. Yeah. Um, again, Hooper and and Quint together is very convincing as you know entitled rich kid with an academic understanding of sea creatures and and the sea, and then uh, Quint having an actual 
you know, visceral in, experience. In-depth working knowledge. Yeah. Um, and then Brody just kind of being there as an observer, but also pretty competent himself. The chummer. The chummer. Yeah, you know, um, the thing that I find, one of the things that I find most compelling about this movie is this is the slasher that makes total sense. Total sense. In the same way that Psycho makes total sense. Right. It's a very pure villain. Right. This is someone who is, in Psycho, it's someone who's psychotic. Even Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Okay, these are people from the the cattle slaughtering industry. Uh-huh. They've gone deranged. They're also, like, to, ex- to an extent, they're all, they all work because they are pure and they make sense in their motives. Right. Um, you know, when you start getting into Jason, Freddy, Chucky, it's less and less believable based on how far away from reality that really can possibly right. be. And it's really driv- the the ridiculousness of those ones are really driven by the sequels. But even Michael Myers at the beginning feels like a little more supernatural than is normal. Right. And that's where Jaws is truly in in its in, you know, in its own waters, so to speak. <laughs> um yeah, uh, it, because this is just a killing machine that kills. Mm-hmm. This is what a shark does. Right. This is a real thing that's out there that can hurt you. This is not some sort of fucking guy who comes to you in your dreams and has knives on his fingers. This is a real possibility for mm-hmm. you and happens to 40 to 50 people a year on average. Yeah, it'd, be like, it'd be like watching Friday the 13th. And being like, wow, that's my most, uh, like, I'm the most scared of Jason. Like, that is my archetype of of fear, is hockey mask, guy with a machete. And then somewhere on YouTube, you find, like, a video of actually Jason in real life, like, murdering people. Uh Uh-huh. That's what Jaws can be. Because you can see actual (laughs) great white sharks attacking people all the time. Yeah. You know. They have a bunch of Jason knives in their mouth. Right. And they come at you from below. Right. Yeah, it's uh it's compelling and it makes sense. And it's uh it's just a it's just a great slasher premise. So while they're on the boat, stakes continue to get raised and then it basically communicates how um even though they seem super prepared and super competent, it shows they are not prepared no. for this shark. And the iconic line of "We're going to need a bigger boat." Yeah. Did you know that that was improvised? That wasn't even in the no in the script. No. Um. And the, the finally, you get a couple glimpses of the actual shark and and the scale of it. Yeah. Like, oh, fuck. Yeah. The above shot down on the boat where the where the shark right uh, goes underneath the boat, and you're like, wow, thing is. Or even when it just. Poked its head out of the water the first time. You're like, "Fuck, girthy." Yes. Yeah, there's a there's a documentary or two about Jaws that are right. worth watching because yeah, the behind the scenes stories of Jaws seem like it was a troubled production. Like, Does it really? It, yeah, it was. I, I can't mean, remember. It's been a while. I think the orca, the boat that they're yeah. on, like sunk three times. <laughs> what? It, there, there was like, well, maybe it only sunk once, but like. The boat at least sunk, like actually sunk. Um, and then I know that there is massive troubles with the shark. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Mechanical, you know, prop. It's it's a, actually a little bit of an annoyance with these Jaws documentaries because so much of it is like, oh, yeah, animatronic shark and blah, blah, blah. There's a, you wouldn't believe the troubles we had this, this fucking shark. Oh, really? Is it hard to get a... A machine to work in the water. <laughs> uh, well, actually, there was a story. I just read it on IMDb before we started recording. Apparently, um, before filming started, Spielberg and George Lucas and probably um, Francis Ford Coppola. It was another direct. Or no, it might have been Scorsese. Mm. So all the like Spielberg, um, Lucas, Scorsese, and uh, Francis Ford Coppola. We're all, like, in the same generation, and they're all, like, friends. Yeah. They're, like, the same, like, auteurs. Mm-hmm. Somehow, they're all friends, and they all succeeded amazingly and right. supported each other. So, apparently, the story is they go and visit kind of the, the prop department, and 
George Lucas sticks his head in the shark to be like, ah, oh, look how big it is. And then as a joke, um, Spielberg and Scorsese, I think, turn on the the thing to, to close the mouth. And then it breaks, and George Lucas gets stuck in the mouth, <laughs> <laughs> which is prescient of what's going to happen in the actual filming, because they, they constantly had problems with the shark, like, seizing up. And so that's the reason why you barely ever see the shark, because there was so little usable footage and they had to work around yeah so many shots that involved the shark um that they could only show it for a couple times um but yeah i guess they they unstuck them and then just ran out and were like uh, i think we broke it guys <laughs> uh, i won't tell anyone uh, and apparently each some, of, some prop guy has a story about how francis ford coppola spielberg <laughs> uh and uh you know, Lucas uh, fucked up my shit. Lucas fucked up my shit. And that's the story of why they're all assholes. <laughs> um, and then the other thing I, I saw was that each shark, there's like three of them. Mm. Um, there's one where like the left side was open and then the right side was open. And there was one that was like completely fully formed. And uh, each one of them costs like $250,000. Whoa! Wow. Yeah. We. So. Um, and that's that old money. That's 1974 yeah. money. Yeah. Whew. So oh. it's, uh, they had a lot of troubles. And then just in between the, the cast, I mean, Richard Dreyfuss and, and Robert Shaw constantly fought. And Robert Richard. Shaw was a huge, <laughs> apparently a huge drunk. Like, Oh, that doesn't surprise me at all. Richard Dreyfuss got caught in Robert Shaw's jaws several times. Yeah. <laughs> Ah, no, ow, ow. He's dripping funny smelling water all over me. <laughs> um, the, I guess the story goes like uh, Robert Shaw would like always drink between takes. Mm -hmm. And he said he some, looked drunk the whole movie. Yeah. Which is in and, character. And he was like, there was a point in which he was like, oh, I wish I could quit drinking. And Richard Dreyfus like grabbed the glass out of his hand and threw it into the ocean. Oh, and everyone's like, oh, because I think Robert Shaw was probably the most known actor out of all of them. Wow. Like he was the most well-respected actor. Yeah. Of that cast. I mean, for good reason. You see it in this. Yeah. He had been in this movie. He had been doing movies since like 1951 or two forty seven. Right. Actually. And, um, and then the other trivia I, I read was, Robert Shaw during the the scene where he's recounting the Indianapolis um you know tragedy uh he was extremely drunk to the point where like it was nothing was usable and then he woke up like the next morning and was like I'm so sorry can, can we can we do that again uh, the french <laughs> Champagne. Uh -huh. Sharks <laughs> biting. Uh, so it's, he, it's weird because he was in an era where a bunch of people couldn't whip out a phone and record him, but he was still being recorded by like the like high quality camera equipment. Right. right. <laughs> like so oh, it was all cut on tape. So oh no. So apparently they reshot that scene and in one take. He when when he was sober, that's what you see on the film. Wow. That's Which one is, take. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it is one take. Well, I mean, I guess he did it a bunch of times the day before, but probably doesn't remember that because he was blackout drunk. Um, but yeah, it's that that scene, that monologue is basically the most compelling moment of the whole film. It's one of the most compelling moments in movie history. Yeah. Just like... He recounts the whole story and then just really communicates the the terror of what a shark is and what it can do. The horror. 1700 and se semen went in the water. It's 1100. 1100? Yeah. Uh, 300 came out. 300 came out. Yeah, it's unbelievable. It's, it's such a, an incredible... And, you know, those... You can you can go buy books written by people who survive such things and they're right. very very similar and they're they're great books. But that line about the eyes is the best yeah. part. Like, dull lifeless eyes. eyes, black eyes, like dull. dull's eyes. That's my Robert Shaw impression. That's a good Robert Shaw impression. Um, so yeah, and then it just 
it just progressively gets worse and the shark progressively like breaks down the boat because it just cannot handle the girth you know <laughs> much like my wife's first night of marriage <laughs> no <laughs> no not, not at all um that was a well is that it <laughs> um and that really like it, it builds up the dread because the boat starts sinking, you know, and the probably the most iconic scene is and it's very much um, like a thing where you kill the most competent character. Right. Like the one that you think is can handle this. Right. They die. So like in Deliverance, you get Burt Reynolds getting shot by an arrow and he's like oh fuck oh. i'm completely useless now yeah and he's like uh, a liability guess we're all getting fucked in the ass now huh boys <laughs> uh practice up your squeal um <laughs> and then so yeah it shows quint getting eaten by the shark which is holds up completely yeah, yeah. no matter how ridiculous that shark looks and how fake it looks like eh, it's just a robot chomping down whipping people around by their torso in in, in like a, a way that gives their neck a little bit of whiplash right is it's uh it's rough to watch right yeah and just the blood and like the spurting from the mouth it's so effective is that a raincoat yes it is there was um there's a i never buy like memorabilia stuff or like action figures even though i really want to think they're cool and yeah. want to mm -hmm. like i think the most i've gotten was like i got a c3po and a rtd2 once mm. you know okay of course took them out of the package because i'll play with them <laughs> gotta play with them um but one of these things that i saw that i'm almost like man that was so cool i wish now that i probably i wish i would have bought it because it would have looked awesome was there is a todd mcfarlane like set i like of, where this is going already of the orca um, and Jaws eating Quint. Wow. It's like that scene. And it looks, it looked so awesome. It looked like perfect. Those McFarlane toys were, were fucking incredible in right. the 90s. Like, I mean, they're still great now, but uh, now you have like Weta and like these, 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 uh, these toys that are, uh, that are, it's become a, a racket because right. of McFarlane toys. I mean, McFarlane toys were so far superior than any other thing that you've ever seen you're like holy shit yeah it looks exactly wow. like the film all of spawn's fingers are fully articulated <laughs> <laughs> uh but i remember seeing that set i'm like god damn that's so cool because it's such an iconic scene the violator's jaw is four inches long <laughs> uh i think the one nerdy thing that i still like and pretty unapologetic. Yeah, the one nerdy thing you still like. Unapologetic about. And then I don't get them as much as I used to, but uh, I, I still get Star Wars Legos. It's just... Oh. Star Wars Legos are awesome. Yeah. Shut up. <laughs> That's not... That doesn't even count. I think, I think like, the real Housewives of Orange County probably do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then... The, I see you're making fun of me. <laughs> I refer I refer back to the ending of, of Jaws so much because it is one of the examples of, like... Ridiculousness, a, but what else are you going to do? Yeah. It's um, such an example of what you can get away with if the audience is with you. Right. Of throughout this whole movie, it's this... Not even a slow burn, but it's ramping it up successively of, like, of showing how... Um, intimidating and how powerful and how unbeatable this shark is to where everyone's like fuck what are we gonna do shark. and um and another example of setup payoff right. where they're like oh oh no oh the air tanks it, ow it hurt my foot yeah you know and then later on it becomes it oh why are you bringing those spendy toys on here yar har, har. <laughs> and uh yeah the ending of jaws is literally an explosion right it's like the most michael bayish ending of like <laughs> all right if you were to put like a 20 year old bro on this film like how would they end this movie well of course you just blow up the sharks blow, blow it up um but for some reason it's the perfect ending and everyone's like that's not rig ridiculous that's a 
that makes perfect sense. That's exactly how it should end. <laughs> yeah, I mean... So when you see movies where you go, the, it was great until the ending, that's indicative that it wasn't great until right. the ending. It means that you weren't bought into it, so you didn't buy the ending. So, interestingly enough, if you put, what did you say, a 20-something-year-old male mm -hmm. into it, I mean, Spielberg was like 25 right. <laughs> when he did this movie. <laughs> well, how should we end it? Well, let's, let's blow it the fuck up. <laughs> Woo! Yeah, so it's Jaws. It's great. If you haven't seen Jaws, like what's... I mean, it's so weird. I'm getting so old now to where, like, it's hard to even watch movies now because they're like oh well i like this movie better <laughs> but they're all like 20 years old now and that's not even like an old film to See, me this is this is the trap that quote unquote old people fall fall into it's one of those things where you i would see which is they lose their luster for the new right and, th and they lose their hope right. you know it really what you're describing is you've lost hope in new movies being able to do it better right and I, for some reason, I, I don't, I, it's not something that happens to me. I'm always looking for the next song that's going to just make the hackles rise. I'm always looking for the next movie that's going to scare the shit out of me. And because I have hope, that's why I don't become old person -y right. like you. Right. I'm, I'm not all the way there yet, but I get it. Yeah. You feeling like, the, I'm feeling like, oh, maybe it's. <laughs> <laughs> Am I so out of touch? No, it no. Was the children, the who children are who are wrong. Uh, <laughs> the so, like for example, I remember on my mission visiting this um, this person. Um, he's an old. He was an old dude, and he just he was retired and he just stayed at home. Every time we visited him, he was watching like a John Wayne movie. This like, is my dad. This is my dad. He never stops watching. It's westerns. Basically, all that he did was just like, I mean, why? Why watch a new movie? I got look at how cheap these old westerns are. I can just buy this entire bookshelf of there's, yeah, there's John Wayne movies. I can literally just... ten million hours of black and white westerns that I can watch. <laughs> and so they're sitting there, and I'm like, wow, like, like how could you not want to watch new movies and like this is know, how my flashy is. action movies and like drama and stuff? And I'm like, why just get in the lane of? And then I realize like. I'm starting to get there. It's like, mm -hmm. well, maybe I could just rewatch, you know, Fight Club again. Or, yeah. Like, nah. none of these directors I like. Like, who is this guy? Which is like a very tempting thing to go into because you get you get distracted by other things. I mean, I've got a family now. It's so hard to, like, find time to watch movies now where it used to be all you did. All I did. Yeah. And now pretty much. The only movies I watch yeah, are for this podcast. Hard to find an hour a month in which to get funky. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm not quite there yet because I still have hope and I still come across like fantastic movies. Right. And, you know, even in the horror genre <laughs> with this podcast. Somewhat related to uh, to this. I'm excited for Aaron Aronofsky's new film, The Whale. Right. Oh, my God. That looks so good. Yeah, so that's, I mean, it's probably still in pre-production. I don't think it's even started yet, but the, the news came out. I think I saw a trailer for it. Really? Uh, maybe. Uh, oh. Maybe I didn't. I, I've just heard the first inkling of it, so I, I'm i kind of out of touch. I used to be so in touch with movie news and stuff. I'd, I'd know what movies are coming out for, like, the next three years. Yeah. But, um, yeah, Aronofsky's new film, The Whale, and it's um, starring... Who was it? Uh, I don't know. Fuck, who was it? Well, who that was attached to uh, it? Oh, oh, uh, Brendan Fraser. Brendan Fraser, that's oh, right. Oh, man. It's not a ocean movie. Right, it's no. It's about it's a, a... Big Fat Man. Big Fat Man. Great Big Fat Man. <laughs> yeah, well, she a great big fat person. Um, so, hugely morbidly obese man that was that's homebound, like, finds his stepdaughter or something, and then she just berates him. Oh man, it looks devastating. Yeah, it looks great. Um, yeah, pretty much anything that Aronofsky or Paul Thomas Anderson or Coen Brothers, Coen Brothers, or what was the other one that I always go back to? Like, I mean, I guess Nolan now, Christopher Nolan. Yeah, 
Nolan is a little like, okay. Yeah, yeah. You're getting... A little long in the tooth here I mean, on the same stuff. Fincher is a little better at... Like, he's still doing super mainstream stuff, but at least the quality is still just as high. Yeah. Nolan gets a little... Um, Michael Bayish played out now. Yeah. Did you did you see Tenant? No, I didn't because of every what everyone was like. Eh. I I bought it. Um, it's the same as if you spell it frontwards as it is backwards. Mm-hmm. Let's get into Sorry, horror, no. horror movie talk. Oh, yeah. oh, 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 so let's uh, let's finish up. So who would who would like? <laughs> Jaws. Shut up. <laughs> All, right. All right, let's get into this. This is so ridiculous. Everybody needs to watch Jaws. Everyone. All right, let's get into horror movie whores. Hoa. 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 Whores. Whore. Whore. Okay, horror movie whores is where we check our voicemail from our listeners, which we call whores because we have no respect for them. We have such a backlog now. I don't. All backed up with thick, whore. thick, ropey loads of whore. 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 We'll whore. 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 I'm sure we have like about a billion from Bugsy, so we'll see how many we can actually play. But here's the. Um, the latest one. If you're familiar with Bugsy, Bugsy Siegel did our outro song. A mm-hmm. uh, little, little ditty that you'll, you'll catch on the back end of this episode. And he is a horror movie talk super fan and patron. So we love Bugsy because he loves us. Okay, here's a message from Bugsy. Dumb, 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 dumb. Retard, 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 retard. <laughs> hey, you fuck. It's your boy Bugsy. Much love, HMT, BNG. Anyways, so excited about the Patreon pick this month. January 2020. Eh, fuck 2020. January 2021. We get Jaws. Finally a movie that's not not pretentious at all. I watched 100 films last year. This was the number, and we ranked 100 films. Me and my homeboy, I've known my entire life. We put this film at the top of all other films. It's crazy because I think it's PG or it's G. If it came out today, it would definitely be R. And there's one scene that's iconic to me. It's a close-up of the dude on the front of the boat, and that there's a shooting star in the background. That actually happened. It wasn't like a effect. So, like, that's just such a great shot, shooting star over one of the best movies of all time. It definitely yes. transgendered, um, you know, the, 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 the genre. I mean, before that, you know, sharks, they either had penises or they had giants. Now they're transgender. So it has to be automatic... 10 out of 10. Much love to all you whores out there. It's your boy Bugsy. I don't follow his, his theory on the transgender part. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Might be a Schrodinger's cat kind of thing. Mm-hmm. You don't know the gender. It's both boy and girl until uh-huh. you actually check the gender, but you can't on a shark because mm-hmm. it's a fucking shark. Um, but did you catch the uh, the shooting star in the background while he's chumming the waters at night? Uh yeah, I think he was like oiling his gun or something. But yeah, that was a real shooting star. Yeah, it was oiling his gun. It was a real shooting star. I had never noticed it before because every iteration of Jaws I had ever seen before this one had was low quality VHS, not remastered, right. and uh, and it was just grainy enough that I couldn't make it out. But this one, I was like, what the fuck was that? Yeah, what was that red streak going right across the whole screen? Yeah, behind his head, perfectly in frame, <laughs> right. and it looks so. So fake. It like, looks I, uh, so fake. It looks like goddamn he's prepping us for ET or something. It really did look like he was prepping us for like close encounters. Right. Yeah, and it was it was real. What was the what were the pantomimes you were doing while Oh, I wanted you to play the show me one titty drop because in this we got one titty. Yeah, we did get one titty. One titty out of uh out of uh Jaws. Yeah, and he does make a good point. It was PG when it was released, but if it was released now, it'd be rated Arr. Arr. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. Okay, next, next caller, uh, next caller. Again, that number is 682-253-4468. Give us a call if you want to get on the show. Hey, yo, what the fuck? This is Rojo from the motherfucking Bronx here calling after I hear this shitty podcast, Best and Worst Horror Movies of 2020. And I'm here... Because I'm pissed off yet again at Horror Movie Talk Whores segment for, for what was it, the best fucking game or something? And you gave it to Glittercore? You played Glittercore's clip when I've been sending you all of that 
sultry, <laughs> sexy stuff? What the fuck? <laughs> so because of that, best co-host of horror movie talk is going to uh, to David's mom. Because she's the realest one. <laughs> Fuck you guys, but I still love you all. <laughs> she's the realest one. <laughs> oh, my mom was so amped up to hear about the... Uh, she was like, the win. Oh, that's nice. They're so nice. She's like, oh, no, they're just being nice to me. I was like... <laughs> I was like, yeah, well, I mean, I did kind of go to bat for you. But yeah, Rojo, uh, oh, man, I, he's he's right. But he doesn't have, I mean, even by, I'm sure by Rojo's own standards, small, I mean, a big tits and a tiny vagina wins right. I mean, in his tastes. I mean, Rojo, Bugsy, they are like the standard uh, voicemail leavers and bring the fire every time. Oh, yeah. But really, if you if you want to show the value that we can get out of the voicemail, I'm sorry, Rojo, but t- uh, big tits and a tiny vagina is like that is such a perfect drop. I really did such a perfect moment of someone being a little little more inebriated than they probably wanted to <laughs> on the voicemail, uh, which we encourage. Which we encourage. Yeah, if you're going to leave a voicemail, take like at least three drinks before yeah, you Yeah, get a gallon of PCP and just go to town. <laughs> David, the pedals make it move more. So, I mean, it was tough competition, Ro. I'm sorry. It's, it's rough. You're uh, doing a lot of PCP? I got a gallon. <laughs> sure do. <laughs> Uh, here's a voicemail from Elizabeth. Hey guys, it's Elizabeth with an S. I'm just calling because I was listening to your uh, best of, worst of 2020. Um, just the one category I wanted to discuss was where we chose worst movie of the year, um, which was Gretel and Hansel. Uh, personally for me, I, I I'm only speaking for myself why I chose it. I chose it because the trailer... I remember the trailer being a little misleading. It kind of geared towards, you know, like a really scary horror movie. Um, and then watching it, I was just a little disappointed with um, the creepy factor was okay. But, you know, obviously aesthetically, yeah, it was really good looking. The set was awesome. Um, the actors were great, except for Hansel. He was kind of annoying. I did not like that little kid. Um, <laughs> but the girl was awesome. Uh, the story, I just wasn't really about it i that's the reason i chose it i was super i think that i chose it because that was the one i was the most disappointed in i was expecting a lot better um and it was just pretty terrible so uh if i had known the host was on that list which i did not see it before i would have chosen that though because that movie is a pile of garbage so right anyway see you later thanks yeah first of all let's get one thing straight the host blows that was that was one we we're most split on. I gave it a nine. Yeah, I, I love that movie. Four. That was such a boring. That was such there. indicative of, an, of twenty twenty. An hour, an hour, and it was still garbage. Um, so yeah, the actual worst movie that was chosen by the Academy was Great. Rats. Oh, what? Yeah. Oh. In the actual episode it was Rats, but uh, a separate from the Academy, we we put a poll on Facebook, and the one that was voted for was. Gretel and Hansel, which is which, which one with a fan? Yeah, it was a popular choice for worst movie among our fans. And I just think they must not have seen some of the other movies because that was not the worst. Movie no, of the year. no, it was by a, a long shot. Yeah, it was. It was actually a pretty entertaining movie, in my opinion. But you know, I mean, or, even if it wasn't like super entertaining, it was very interesting. Yeah, yeah, I liked. Uh, it, it, I think a lot of people may have been put off by the slow pacing of it. Yeah. Um, Thanks, Elizabeth. We sure do appreciate you explaining, you know, why the host blows. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Happy HMKs. Happy New Year. Fuck 2020 in the ass with one of those things from Seven that's like a blade on a dildo. You <laughs> don't really see it. It's off screen. Anyways, it's your boy Bugsy, Bugsy Siegel. And I just watched that Terra Train recently. I think I saw it on Prime for free. I saw, you know, an 80s movie, rated R, horror, Jamie Lee Curtis. It looked like it had decent reviews. I went to watch it, and Terror Train is terrible. What a fucking terrible movie. That was in the spot after Halloween, the original 78, where Jamie Lee shits herself Activia, couldn't get any work outside of doing horror. So this was in between Halloween 1 and Halloween 2, when they brought back, you know, Myers, because they had to do a sequel, and John Carpenter had to get drunk to write it. Anyways... What the fuck were they thinking with this fucking movie? This movie is terrible. It is on the level of I hate it. 
I hate it so bad. I almost had to burp, which would have been perfect for this podcast. Anyways, I hated this fucking movie so bad. It is terrible. It was a waste of time. If I could set the new year back and go back to 2020, it was that bad. No, it wasn't that bad. This movie fucking sucks. It blows dick. <laughs> and he goes on like that. So he didn't like Terror Train. Um, I mean, I can't say I blame him. It was not a good movie. Yeah, I'm I'm going to be in agreement on Bugsy on this one. Like, Terror Train was probably, like, one of the least enjoyable watches of the year. Yeah. Just um, capping off the year with a pile of shit. But it was interesting for a couple different reasons. You know, I had Jamie Lee Curtis in there. and Yeah, it was not interesting uh, enough for me. Uh, a compelling party um, that would have been fun to attend. Sure. Also, there were some nice boobies. <laughs> not that I'm into that kind of thing. I'm totally sexless. Mm. And not interested in sex. Hello, and this is Rojo from the Bronx calling yet again and today I just wanted to issue a testimonial to anyone who is listening for the first time and to any sponsors that might be listening or any future sponsors that want to listen to the show. As a longtime listener, I feel that horror movie talk quite frankly doesn't get the appreciation nor the attention it deserves. And as a strong independent man who also identifies as a queer but who is also cisgendered and multiracial, yet quite pale and white presenting. <laughs> this podcast truly provides an escape for me from my day-to-day -day troubles and the oppression that I face not only from the white cisgendered men that run the country, but also the patriarchy. This podcast has provided me a medium to express all of the deep and dirty things and I'm feeling inside that I just can't talk to anyone about. The segment Horror Movie Talk Whores truly feels like it was made for me. A fan. For the fans. So anyone listening, oh, please disregard that. I'm also an essential worker at a hospital. <laughs> disregard that alarm there. That siren. So anyone listening who feels this podcast might not be for them, you should probably listen to another horror podcast that will be a bit more accepting of your insecurities that you, as an oppressor, feel. Thanks, guys, you dirty fucks. <laughs> there it is. If you're, if you're also an oppressor who doesn't like oppressing people, then you should go elsewhere. Oh, yay, David! Yay! Yay! Man, uh, Rojo really has quite the list of, uh -huh. uh, you know, of uh, qualifiers at the beginning of his name. Yeah. You know, he's... Multiracial, white presenting, uh, queer, but also cisgendered male. Mm. Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, in in the in the uh, in the social justice Olympics. I mean, I think he's pro if he was if he was instead a woman or or identified as a woman. I think he'd probably rank a little higher. Well, let's just give it time. Okay, you never know. Yeah, I, I mean, we got a real rainbow coalition of listeners just represented in, in Rojo. Yeah. From the Bronx. Exactly. Um, here's one from someone we haven't heard from before. Shelby? Hi, guys. This is Shelby. Uh, I'm from Chicago. Uh, I'm a new listener. I started listening to you guys this year. Uh, the first episode I listened to was the Hellraiser. One which and that pretty much got me into you guys. Uh, I just wanted to say that you guys are awesome and just keep doing what you're doing. And I look forward to more episodes in the future. Okay, bye. Oh, that's nice, oh, Shelby. Thanks. I guess it's a bad time to announce that we're going to discontinue the podcast, oh. and not do it anymore. No, yeah, we're we'll we'll be doing it. Thank you so much for calling and. And it really helps out hearing people that actually like it. I, it's hard for me to believe that people... Are. I know. I can't... My self-esteem won't allow me to accept it. It just makes me feel weird. Because we're just sitting in this room, like, talking to each other. We don't really... Right. It's, yeah. It's a weird... Um, here's another one from Elizabeth. A really dirty room. Hmm. Yeah. Well... <laughs> hey, guys. It's Elizabeth. I haven't really called... Or been on Facebook in a, for a while because my line of work is uh, busy during the holidays. I hope you guys had a very nice holiday. Um, the reason I'm calling is because I was listening to the Hellraiser video and you guys were talking about your favorite non-horror movie. 
movies. And it got me thinking, um, was there a movie when you were younger or even as an adult that like freaked you out or scared you that was unintentional? Uh, so for example, mine was Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Absolutely love the Indiana Jones movies, but Temple of Doom, man, that thing, really freaky, especially watching that as a kid. I think that's actually the movie that got me really into horror movies as a kid and even now as an adult. So, well, I hope you guys have a nice day, have a nice holiday, and uh, be safe and see you later. Bye. Another Spielberg movie. Bye. Thank you for calling, Elizabeth. Yeah, thanks, Elizabeth. Yeah, Temple of Doom has some great sequences in it like where he's pulling out the fucking heart from a guy's chest okay like temple that. of doom is a horror movie I, <laughs> yeah it just is um but no i know what you're talking about i love this quest. i love this question because i'm constantly uh thinking about like getting my kids into right the things that i got into right. to try and give them a similar trajectory because i'm so pleased with my entry into horror um it almost like I don't know. My, when I try to show my kids anything scary, they just run out of the room. Like oh. even if it's like Pixar, man, and it's just like the tension is heightened. They are out of the room. My girl, my girl will sit there and fucking like, whoa. She'll sit there and be like, oh fuck, and I'll be like, is this too scary? And she, you'll see her pause and be like, no, no, we have to keep watching this. And right. then you pay for it on the back end because she's like. Right. I'm fucking terrified. But, uh, yeah, no, actually, another Spielberg film, uh, Jurassic Park. Yeah. Fucked me up. I was into dinosaurs so hard. Um, and How um, old were you when you saw Jurassic Park? That feels like a... It's 92, man. 92. So I was, uh, I guess I was eight. Yeah. Wow. Eight years old. But, um, but, uh, the, so I have a whole list of these. So The Adventures of Mark Twain which was yeah, a yeah. claymation movie that was fucking alarmingly weird. Yeah. If you guys the devil scene is like iconic. Yes, if you have not seen The Adventures of Mark Twain, it's it's fucked up. It's 1985 yeah. and it's uh it's not what you what the title implies at all. Uh-huh. <laughs> um The Labyrinth, a lot of uh, Jim Henson so The Labyrinth and The Dark Crystal. Uh-huh. Uh a lot of a lot of anime that I for some reason was able to get my hands on huh. at like six, seven, eight years old. Really? So like Ghost in the Shell huh. and Akira. Um, like I watched these movies like almost as they came out somehow. I think we had HBO on our satellite mm, dish. Okay. Um, so yeah, I have a, a lot of these non-horror horror movies that really, really informed my... D- the Labyrinth is one of... is still one of my favorite movies. Ever. Yeah, I mean, for me... It's hard to remember them, but like the the two that come to mind is yeah, Labyrinth just is this weird. It's not even super scary. It's just like oh wow, this is this is wrong. Yeah, because it shows like the fairies and they're like vermin. Yeah, <laughs> the guy yeah, and he's spraying, killing them, and killing the they fairies. They bite you, and it's You're like, like Jesus. Yeah, um, and that's just dirty. The other one that I the one that I can definitely point to of like whoa, this is too much for my little mind to where it's like embedded yeah is return to oz (gasps) yes i just recently watched that that's on disney plus is it yeah it's on disney plus um with uh veruca or not veruca um yeah is that the little girl who played veruca no no no, it's not um it's the girl from the water boy um what's her what's her name (laughs) i have no idea oh okay (laughs) anyways yeah i mean that one that scene with the what was it? The queen that could change heads. Ozma. There's like a hall full of like different heads. Yeah, Ozma. Ozma. And uh, that is frightening. Yeah, that one's from 1985 as well. And I'm thinking of Feruza Balk, not Veruca Salt. <laughs> Feruza Balk. Um, who was Dorothy? Um, yeah, and the, well, was and she the- Dorothy in it? Mm-hmm. I didn't even know it was actually Dorothy. I thought it was like a completely separate person. No, yeah, it's returned to it's she's returning oh, to us. I guess that makes sense. And uh and the chicken that lays eggs and the dwarf king and uh who's the mountain who's you know like the claymation mountain guy. Yeah, yeah it's a it's a crazy cool movie. The other one um also is like Never Ending Story had some like oh. super like I mean Think of think of being yeah. like a young impressionable kid, like an five. actual child. Yeah, I was five when seen, I saw the nothing. Seeing Artax die, 
and, and a muck and, and like, the fucking shit that fucking nothing running out of that cave and the, <laughs> right right and oh yeah there's so many uh, existential threats in that movie it's yeah. really scary. Like, the whole world is going to collapse, and, Another... and reading a book can fucking kill you. And right. Like, it's like, oh, God. And then the other one that has a scene that I, now my mind is being jogged. Another, like, scene that is randomly in a non-non-horror movie is in uh, Pee-wee's Big Adventure with Large Marge. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great moment of, like, he looked just like this. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and like, um, later, like, a lot of Tim Burton stuff kind of had... Yeah, yeah, uh, Edward Scissorhands was was pretty alarming to see yeah. just visually. It was like... Uh, Man, I should go back and watch Ed, Edward Scissorhands. Oh, yeah. I, I, I don't think I've watched that as an adult. Vincent Price, man. Vincent Price. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, yeah, that's... Um, it's interesting to, interesting to see what gets people into horror. Hi, my name is Lauren. I'm from Michigan. I'm calling because I'm listening to your seven episode. And although your message saying that I might be um, mocked. What? What? Oh, sorry. That was a long pause. My cat. Sorry. Um, <laughs> mocked. And now I for sure will be on a future episode. Um, that kind of deterred me. But then I thought, you know what? It's okay. So I wanted to say, I agree with whoever said that Seven is not a horror film. And forgive me, I don't know your name. This is my first time ever listening. That was Bryce. I stumbled upon you. And I think Seven is a thriller. Definitely not a horror film. Definitely not? And or definitely. That is definitely all I not. Say. Mock away. See, but, yeah. I've, but we've both said consistently that thrillers fall under the veil of horror. Especially no, I'd, I'd on... say thriller uh, horror falls under the umbrella of thriller. What? Yeah, you're fucking retarded. Mm. Oh my god! Oh my god! Uh, Are thriller... you? S- we've said this before. Thriller. Is so- well, There's you've said rec- before. No, you have as well. There's recorded evidence of this. Well, yes, thriller uh, is sometimes equated to horror, but really, if you look at the movies that are labeled thriller, it's such a much bigger umbrella. Look, I know you guys think I'm, you know, retarded or whatever. <laughs> like, there's like uh, movies with like, like clear and present danger mm-hmm. would be marked as a thriller. But mm. is, is that a horror movie? No. No. Not not even in the slightest. But it's thrilling. It's uh, yeah, it's, but it's that's not much... what uh, thrilling is. Not what's intended by the by the label thriller. If you look at if you look at thriller, that is like kind of how it's applied in genre in movies. It's uh, like uh, political thrillers. Like Clear and Present Danger is a political thriller. Yeah, mm. So that's a much bigger umbrella than horror, which is specifically where does Michael Jackson's thriller lie? Michael Jackson uses thriller as. Horror. Oh, well, then, and I stand by my opinion. Oh, so you agree with everything Michael Jackson does, then? Yes, okay. everything. <laughs> <laughs> the man was a musical genius. Everyone is allowed some hobbies. Also, I think I think Bill Cosby and R. Kelly are on record as saying that thrillers are horrors. So. Right. Well, I mean, also geniuses of their professions. <laughs> Top-notch. Uh, top-notch comedian and a top-notch child pisser. <laughs> so Lauren calls again and leaves this message. Hi, Lauren from Michigan again. I just called. And I have to say, I was a little disappointed that I'm not able to edit my message <laughs> or re-record. Remember back in the day when you could do that? You could press the button, listen to your message, and then if you didn't like it, you could re-record. You know, um, I get this, I'm getting this like flashback from Swingers, how that guy just kept calling and crying. <laughs> and um, although I don't want to seem like him, John Favreau is not a terrible person to be like, I suppose. But anyway, at the end of my message, you will hear buttons being pressed. And that is because I was hoping that I could re-record because of my long pause. <laughs> so anyway, like I said, seven, it's a thriller. Not a horror film. 
but I really am enjoying you guys anyway. Right. Well, <laughs> thanks, Lauren. I have a few things to say about Lauren. First of all, she seems like uh, uh, a lady I would like because there's some sadness in that voice. <laughs> and I appreciate my ladies to be. I like, I like the company of sad people, generally speaking. But also, um, was it? I think one of the clips from um, the um, the year in review of of uh, our thirstiest moments was you describing Misha, whatever her name is, yeah, from me, uh, it follows. Yeah, and you're like, I like her because she's sad. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, this is really telling me something about David. I do. I, I like I like people who are who are glum. Well, that's why you like me, right? <laughs> We've stumbled upon it. So if you lose that, I won't like you. Anymore. I know. So you have to stay sad. Don't worry. Even the antidepressants don't help. So, but, <laughs> but even but even then, uh, Lauren, uh, I'm glad you're not able to edit your message because then you could potentially, you know, change your opinion and have a correct opinion. And I, I want you to stay on record as being incorrect in your opinion. So about thrillers. Um, thank you for enjoying our show. And if, you know, I mean, who am I, who am I to say what a thriller, I'm just a, a, a horror movie reviewer. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's also, I mean, I don't want to be super presumptuous, but I think I get the, the, um, the feeling that, um, Lauren might have had a couple drinks before she called us. No. And I think that happens with especially the women callers. No. On voicemail. No. Because that's, that's where Glittercore went on record as having big tits and a tiny vagina. Because that, she was Oh, so she, if, if someone speaks their truth, now they're drunk? No, I'm just saying like a little bit of like uh, fumbling the phone, weird, awkward pauses going off topic. I don't Lauren, I'm sorry if this is uncharacteristic of who you are, but I, I get a feeling sometimes with especially the women callers that it takes a couple drinks for them to get into it, which is indicative of my experience with women in general. <laughs> um, wow. Uh, wait, what are you saying? What we Now we need to dial, delve deep. Let's me too, Bryce, here real quick. Next message. Your compliment was sufficient, Lewis. Hey, guys, it's Josh in Canada. I'm listening to the Paranormal Activity 3 uh, podcast, the early release, and David, you just scored this movie a fucking a 10 out of 10. Like, you're saying it transcends genre boundaries and deserves to win awards but shouldn't? That's right. Paranormal Activity fucking 3. You are saying that this movie is yeah. as good as, on the same level, as Alien? Yes. Dude, I think you're fucked out of your gourd if you think that's the case. Anyway, hope you guys are having a good day. Ciao. Canadians always talk big, but then then you just go, "Oh yeah, you're you're from Canada," you know, and it's just kind of. I mean, I'm I'll go on record with a green with him here. Like you gave kinda, it a ten too. I did not. What All did right. you give it? I don't know. I give it like a seven or an eight. Ah, uh, we're gonna have to check the record on this. I one. absolutely because I remember you giving it a ten out of ten. I was like, "What the fuck?" See, but this, but uh, I mean, so really, uh, so first of all, thanks for supporting us, and th my Canada comments are obviously frivolous and silly, but this does place a little bit of emphasis on what I've said uh, primarily this whole time that we've done horror movie talk, which is it's fucking ridiculous to review and rate horror movies or any movies mm -hmm. because you're essentially reviewing and rating preference, your own personal preferences on art, which is totally subjective. And yeah, like while I love alien, I also love paranormal activity three and I don't, I do not, I don't see a problem with it. It, you know, it does transcend genres for me. This is an impressively made movie that toys with a lot of aspects that uh, of movie making that I enjoy a lot. Does that does that mean you will enjoy it to that level? No. It doesn't. It's a silly thing to rate movies. Mhm. Mm to give yes. it a score? Yeah, especially rating Paranormal Activity a 10. No. That's extremely silly. I'll tell you what, if I'll start a grassroots movement right now. Grassroots. I'll start a horror movie talk movement that says we should change our scoring system mm. to be thumbs up or thumbs down. See it, don't see it. Because 
I don't know. I just I I do. This is a, a foundational problem with the scoring system. Yeah, is it's just your opinion, man. You know. Yeah, it's funny when we when I read. I was just thinking about that when I was reading the the intro where every time we explain the scoring, which yeah. seems like super redundant, but it's a holdover from like one of the f- first couple episodes. Yeah, where you know out of our. 10 listeners or whatever yeah there was a couple people that reached out and were like i want to know why well what? what what exactly i mean what's the score you give it or like not right. not only not only was this the score but we gave it a score but we didn't explain the scoring system because it's it's too hard to understand what one out of ten means yeah or like, which it's not, but I mean, it's it's, so it's got exp- so there's nuance throughout it, yeah, a, a scoring system. It's so so weird that you have to explain it every time, but you really do because, like you said, it's subjective. It's not inherent, and yeah, you have to know what you know what you're dealing with. Um, I think we should move to a one to thousand <laughs> scoring, and with like decimal points. <laughs> Why not just move just to so it, one, one to a million and skip the decimal points? I still need a decimal point. <laughs> I mean, there's what? too much granularity to deal with. Yeah. I mean, the standard is like five stars. And it's like, how can you, how can you rate movies on just five stars? I, and, and I think that's why, I think that's why the thumbs up, thumbs down, see it, don't see it thing works better than the scoring system is because when you give movies a five, you've just copped out of, of telling people whether or not they should watch it. Uh, you've just basically said, eh, it's average, and then, then left them to their own devices. It forces you to draw a line in the sand between movies that they should spend their money on and movies that they shouldn't. Yeah. You have a point. Mm. Yeah, because a five is a cop out. I mean, it's it's I also a fair score. Yeah, but it's ha- it's hard to make a decision based on that. And yeah, I would, but when you see that's the thing, I would not want to recommend a five or be forced into recommending a five. Great, because it's like it's up to you. Right, like does it? Do you care enough? about a mediocre movie to go see it just for a couple things of interest maybe right yep it's like it's up to you i can't i can't tell you whether it's uh worth seeing or not i can tell you how i felt which is like yeah it's it's a movie right i mean a a more apropos rating system might be what like did you feel like you like you got your money's worth you know like would you see it again or something like that so yeah. Would you recommend it to a friend to go see that kind of thing? Yeah. Well, got Bryce thinking. I can mm-hmm. see these gears turning. Thousand point system. Mm-hmm. I'm telling you, it's really going to solve how these many, problems. How many decimal points? Three. Wow. To the, the trace commas. Yeah. <laughs> trace commas. Trace commas. Does this stand for? You know what? what that stands for? It's a billion. I'm a billionaire. <laughs> David just got into. Um, Silicon. Silicon Valley. I think yeah. we'll talk about that on the Afterpod. Yeah, today's Afterpod will be a lot of Silicon Valley. All right. So thank you for calling, leaving messages. We we had one more from from uh, Rojo and. Well, you got to play it. Uh, okay. These are pretty outdated, but this is from Rojo and another one from Bugsy. Okay. This is Rojo from the Bronx again. You dirty fucks. I'm here to tell you that uh, the Bryce, you read the wrong number. <laughs> During this, uh, what what what's the pod? What's the podcast? Be- better watch out! You called out the wrong number for the callback for the voicemails. I just wanted you to know. That's about it. Fuck you guys. Love you guys. And keep being sexy. Um, sorry. Well, obviously, you found a way to to call us. So then again, that number is. What's up, you dirty? F- Number is 682-253-4468. Bucks, this is Rojo from the Bronx calling back again after listening to the Better Watch Out Review podcast, which fucking sucks, but I love you guys. Now, here's the question. Mary, F for the kids listening, or kill? Santa Claus, (laughs) but he's a big, thick silver daddy. The Easter Bunny. Or an old Dutch man dressed as a turkey. 
my decision. I would marry Santa Claus because, like I said, he's a big old thick silver daddy, and I know he can get it whenever, even if he only works one day of the year. I'm going to kill the Easter bunny because, God forbid, you knock up a bunny and you end up having 12 kids, and no one's got time for 12 kids. Then I'm going to fuck the turkey because I've always wanted to stuff a turkey with my own personal <laughs> stuffing. So, guys, what's it going to be? Marry, fuck, or kill? All say, right, well, now I'm happy I played that. Yeah, I'm going to say, I'm going to say marry the rabbit because I like kids mm. and also I like sex. So you get the best of both worlds there. Hmm. Um, that's how I'm going with that. And then, and then fuck Santa because uh, that's got, I mean, pfft, you imagine the, imagine the stories he's going to tell, you know, hmm. he's got a lot of, a lot of fucking stuff. And he already kind of knows you. A little bit. Uh-huh. A, he sees you when you're sleeping. He knows you've been naughty. You know? He knows you've been naughty. <laughs> and then who needs a fucking turkey? What about you? Yeah. I would kill the turkey because who cares? Yeah. Um, I would fuck the Easter bunny because, uh-huh. you know, it's got... It knows where... It's, it's got knows a bunny. It's way yeah. around your dick. It's bunny. It's soft. It's like, you Ooh. know... Yeah. It's a hot... Hot bunny. Oh. It's like when Bugs Bunny is wearing a dress. Yeah. Like, how can you resist? You can't. You and cannot. then, you know, yes, you might knock it up, but conveniently, the Easter Bunny lays eggs. Right. So you just kick the fuck out of those eggs. Like, I don't even think you have to feel guilty about that, because it's not, it doesn't feel like an abortion. It's more of like, oopsie. What's up, Doc? <laughs> oopsie, I stepped on the egg. Oh, well, I guess we won't have kids. And then you just never call back. Right. <laughs> You find the egg. You no, know, you, you know, what really happens is you find the egg 12 years later somewhere in your house behind something and it's all dried out. And you're like, what? Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is Easter egg from 12 years ago. I abandoned my boy. I abandoned my boy. Um, and then I would marry Santa Claus mm. because, I mean, he's a big old bear. I think he's very body positive. Oh, like, I yeah. think we get along with that. And he's a giver. Dude, he's, you know, yeah, he is the giver. Yeah. He's the symbol of giving. So, I mean, he would be a very generous lover. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he loves kids. Yeah. And also just like, I don't know, but that's kind of hard because you'd never be able to cheat on Santa because he'd see you. Yeah, he'd see when you're sleeping when, with someone else. Awake. But, I mean, I wouldn't need to because, you know, he's a big old well, you better, silverback bear. You better you know? watch out, you know. You better watch out. You better watch out. You better watch out. You better watch out. Here's a call from Bugsy. What's up, Doc? Um, Wait, are you gonna call play the call from Bugsy? I thought it was. I thought the second one was gonna be from Bugsy, but it oh, was actually from okay. Never mind. So Bye, I th- Bugsy. I think that's here's a song from Bugsy instead. Um, yeah, we'll play a song from Bugsy. But yeah, every time I think of Santa, I think of that. Um, uh, What's that, what's that show called that we mentioned before? Balls Out? No. What's oh, it, what's oh, it called? Oh, um, yeah, that Vice show. All I can't, balls? Or... I can't think of it. I can't think of it. <sighs> I can't remember. But the one on Bears. Yeah, yeah. That's like a must-see. Yeah. Got to find that on YouTube. Okay. So thank you for listening. Um, our website, again, is horrormovietalk.com. If you like the show, share it with a friend or call us at our voicemail, 682-253-4468. Um, lots of different ways you can support the show if Please you're so support inclined. us. We are we're starving podcasters. Mm-hmm. We need your help. Yeah, it would be really great if we could quit our jobs and just do podcasting. My God, can I we mean, quit our jobs yet? I just want to live the dream. Um Almost there. Just need about a mm, hundred times more income. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, we'll know. We, we, we'll get there. When you hear the sound of the gun cocking in the background, <laughs> you'll know our movie talk is done. All right. Thank you. Bye. And we'll see you next time. Bye. 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 Looking for a podcast full of burps and gas, perverted cast, skinny and fat, look no further. Horror Movie Talk is accidentally funny, begs to donate money, fake sponsors for dummies, and so much more. New episodes every hump day, they'll pickle your dickle for foreplay. 
Patreon members have it your way. Vote for a movie every month for the review. Chopper Chopper, don't just stare at it, eat it like a taco. Put your tongue through the phone, hoodie Picasso. Look at them hot kids, swear not a pedo. Got me too, with Cosby eating jello. Pudding pop done, gave Bryce flatulence. Train addict, addict Dave doesn't give a shit. One through ten, is it horrible or excellent? Oil me up, daddy is dinner rum. Ten kids, Bryce Hansen. Look at them hot kids, Chris Henson. Masturbate with a crucifix, exorcist. Face hugger, chest bursters, alien. Linda Blair peed on Sigourney Weaver. I know it's true, cause it came from social media. Patrick Bateman can't understand you. Stab you to death for rotten apple reviews. Opinionated podcaster with a doctorate. Spook allergy, doctor of philosophy. Bad gastritis, knee colostomy. Turn Patreons into human centipedes. David Doobie Day, scare him, no, no expert. A global fucks hard, professional sex expert. After pods, taglines, and porno flicks. American Psycho, them guys pretty sick. Chopper Chopper, don't just stare at it, eat it like a taco. Put your tongue through the phone, hoodie Picasso. Look at them hot kids, swear not a pedo. Got me too, with Cosby eating jello. Pudding pops done, gave Bryce flatulence. Train addict, addict Dave doesn't give a shit. One through ten, is it horrible or excellent? Oil me up, daddy is dinner rubs. Nothing good happens in the woods. Always get more than you bargain for. Got a pickle to dickle. Machines tickle bitties. Killer on the phone. Ain't no sharing stone. Vancouver, Portland, Oregon, and organs. Corona, COVID, curse, Lorona. Green River Killer, because reasons. Hallway of poop monster kids screaming. It's your ordinary dingleberry itinerary. 30 day shutter and jump scares ain't fucking scary. Time for the spoilers with jokes and tropes. Use their white socks to catch their loads. To show them one titty, pretty. Paganism, you should worship. They Teflon dicks. Pacific Northwest, let them see one breast. Shifty the ass, they spooky. Poor man's digress. Bugsy. HMT. Horror movie talk. Hold on, they don't like Halloween. Fuck them.